Hey otters, shit is getting a little bit real out there. So, we're here to entertain you, keep you posted, and get you in all that gaming goodness, as for a lot of us, we probably are going to get a lot of hobby time for the next few weeks. Right, stay tuned to the end of the show because we have another 3D model that we're giving away for you guys to try and print at home. We have this beautiful piece. Just look at it. You're going to love it. We'll tell you more about that at the end of the show in 3D printing. It's the shit. Right, we have an amazing prize. We're giving away a British Army bundle. So this is the new Flames of War British Late War, okay? So you're going to get the starter force. You're going to get the book. You're going to get the cards. And you're even going to get early access to these cute little Daimlers. So this armored car troop, we have some of these that we're going to chuck in as well. Right, to be in with a chance of winning that, here's what we need you to do. Hit like hit subscribe and post a comment below. And if you could share, that would be amazing. These videos can get like a thousand likes, but YouTube still chooses not to distribute them. So anything you can do to help us get the word out about the show um, would be absolutely amazing, guys. Be awesome. Right, it's time to get on with things because the weekend starts now. Yes, it's weekender time, otters. We are moving into that phase of, if we're all going to end up locked up, you're going to need entertainment. So we are, <laughs> we, are, we are basically getting ready to inform and entertain over this period. We're going to get a load of hobby done. Yeah, I'm actually currently working on a remote presence, kind of like Sheldon. Do you know what? There's going to be, there's going to be some major issues on planet Earth when this is all over because the amount of reduction in all of our painting piles, Ooh. by the time this is over, it could be amazing. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't worry about that. That's, uh, it's not gonna make a dent in my painting pile. <laughs> well, whatever your, your painting pile is the equivalent of the local junkyard. Yeah. On a more serious note, we are, we are taking precautions. We are trying to gear up um, just in case this does end up where we all end up in kind of having to spend time at home. So we're looking at what we can do to try and work with you guys, keep you entertained, and just to, you know, collectively huddle virtually and enjoy some hobby together. So next week, if I'm right, Jerry, yes. next week we're going to be launching the Spring Clean Challenge. We are. Mm. So stay tuned to next week. We will show you the project system. Just to give you a recap of how the project system works, We'll launch the spring, team, the spring Clean Challenge because it's nice low-hanging fruit hmm. for all of us as hobby uh, hobbyists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll get some prizes. We'll get. We'll maybe try and see if we can get a couple of live streams and, and things like that. So yes, we are, we are doing our best to try and make sure that you can't stop the signal. There we go. Right. We got a thing in the post. We did yes. get a thing in the post. We got three things in the post. And I want to look at them, okay? We got, um, uh, our buddies over at Privateer Press sent us um, three miniatures from uh, Warcaster, the new game that's well, currently on Kickstarter. Neo Warcaster Neo Mechanica. Yes, these are three miniatures yes. from Warcaster. Yes, thank you. And they happen to be called Neo Mechanica. <laughs> Good that Justin is keeping us right. We No fear of coronavirus. Well, we have Justin. He will keep us right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can, we get a, can we get a gander at these? We, we can. Yeah. So they sent three from the um, Marcher Worlds faction. So yes. this is the uh, Coalition Weaver Warcaster. Uh-huh. Which is a... Oh, so oh, I'm wrong. Delightful. So, so the faction's not called Neo Mechanica. No, no the game is Neo Mechanica. I'm talking about The game is arse. Warcaster. Look, it says in clear letters <laughs> on your screen right there. Warcaster. I'm yeah, talking about... In less clear letters, Neo Mechanica. I thought right. because it's just name, so less clear. <laughs> when I'm right... When I'm you're right... right you're right. Yeah, what do you think I gave you the, the sneaky little bird? You gave me a bird. <laughs> right, okay. That's right. So, yes, for Warcaster, Neo Mechanica, yeah. and these are the Marcher Worlds. Yeah. Okay. 
So here we have one of the Ranger fire team. So mm -hmm. this is, uh, I think, one of a three pack of, of standard troopers. That it's got a really nice, um, beautiful. It's got that sort of Arabian. We, we're going to hang material off our armor yeah. style going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, really interesting little sculpt. Now and these are metal minis. They are the beautiful yeah. metal. And I, I've got to say, I'm over the moon with that. Um, I got a chance to have a, a, a feel of these. Mm -hmm. and, uh, just that, that sense of presence, that mm. sense of weight. I absolutely love them. This is something I used to always adore about the old War Machine miniatures, was the War Jacks were just big and chunky and heavy. They felt good on the tabletop, and if you were losing, you could lump it into your opponent's head to win that way. <laughs> I've, I've got always, to say, always lash out. The 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 quality of these miniatures. Yeah, is they're razor sharp. Utterly superb, Jerry. Did they come in many parts? Uh, the one you have there was, uh -huh. which is the coalition waiver. Yeah. So that was uh, backpack, head, and this arm. Mm -hmm. and the arm, as you can see, just comes around and connects to the backpack. So, yeah. So that was that. So three parts, easy to put together. Yeah. Yeah. All very, very straightforward. This was two, or sorry, three parts. So this arm slash weapon mm -hmm. had a weird like half moon fit straight into that body. So most of the shoulder and torso is actually part of this section. And then the elbow and knife. Can you a see the join? Part. Uh, if you can see the join, good luck to you. Yeah. Old buddy, old pal. So Holy it, smokes. It, it was a, a remarkable bit of yeah. cut and shut job on that one. And then the final mini then? The final one is the Dusk Wolf Warjack. Yeah. Um, which came in, well, it came in many parts because the legs were separate, the torso and then the arms, plus the weapons. Mm -hmm. Because the weapons are interchangeable, you can put um, underslung weapons on both arms and you have a variety of choices, plus this beast of a cannon on top. So a bit of an opportunity to magnetize that bad boy, maybe? Yeah, I chose not to. I use super glue because they literally arrived yesterday and I put them together last night and sprayed them last night. Mm -hmm. So you'd be looking at something less metal than metal. Um, but yeah, definitely for the actual game component, even the head, actually, there's two variant heads for yeah. the Dusk Wolf. Um, so you could, if you wanted to, magnetize it up to give you a bit more options on the tabletop. Um, you, want, you can see nice. paint it as well there. Yeah. No, I don't need to see him paint that I've got one in front of me. <laughs> I actually prefer um, w uh, the beginnings of Jerry's scheme there, if I've got to yeah. say. I like that dark, gritty look yeah, the dusky yeah. uh, that they're getting. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's wonderful. There's a lot to be said for sepia tone. I'm yeah. a big fan of sepia tone. Um, but yeah, so, it's a lovely uh, little thing. Warren used to swear about it. Yeah, swear I, about I love it. Or at it. I love it. I think uh, I'm, I'm so, so impressed with um, not only the art direction on this, but the, the qualities of the mini uh, has utterly sold me. Mm. Yeah, and, the, and the fact that they're, 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 they're solid. You can have metal minis, and we've mm. all had them in the past that mm. have lots of little footery bits and stuff that make them, uh, make them a difficult uh, proposition to put together, but I've been no, no, chucking fi these around. 15 minutes, chuck these in here, and they were done and dusted. Yeah. Um, so the build is very quick, and I've done no cleanup. I, I literally did no cleanup. No cleanup no at all. No cleanup at all. So, so what they see is basically what yeah. came out of the pack. Then. Yeah. So you can, if you, sp oh, I mean, if you can barely see it, there's a mold line on the desk at the back of the weapon there, mm -hmm. right where my fingertip is. Mm. So that would need to be cleaned. But that is so minuscule, uh, it's not even worth talking about. And beyond that, I can't actually see any other joint points or seam lines on much of the miniatures at all. So yeah. Um, so they're very clean casts metal um, and these are some of the very first um, prototypes because I think most of the rest of the stuff on their site uh, or on the Kickstarter is, is render still mm -hmm. um, so yeah they're, they're uh, a lovely lovely set to put together and should be quite nice to paint up on top of that mm. <clears throat> I don't know if you guys have had a chance I, I got a, a bit of a chance to watch some of the playthroughs they've been live streaming mm. Proctor Press live stream oh yeah religiously um, these days and I got a chance to watch um, a bit of the uh, a playthrough, and I thought, oh, "This is this is smart. Mm. Some really nice mechanics uh, in this game." See, I, I had a, a good read through the the Kickstarter a little while ago, and some of the the concepts they talk about on the Kickstarter, like being able to to summon additional units onto the tabletop through mm -hmm. like the I think it's some form of gate. Yeah, you know, it just it really changes how you're going to be playing the game, and I'm mm -hmm. I'm very curious to get a, a few of these down on the table and have a go. There you go. If you haven't checked it out, guys, go and check out um, uh, Warcaster Neo Mechanica 
um, on Kickstarter. Um, there's, I think it was about just, seven, about a week, seven yeah. days, about a week left yeah, or so. And they're, they're doing pretty damn well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There, oh, we there we go. Yeah. So um, uh, definitely go and uh, check it out. Right. Front of the show, mm. our commitment to the little guys and gals out there. It's time for Indie of the Week. Who Excellent. picked it? Who picked it this week? I may have picked it this week. Oh, uh -huh. <laughs> I can guess where we're going to go. Who did, who did you pick? I picked Brigade Games um, because Ooh. it's it's an unusual site. They are a an online retailer who actually started branching out into doing their own stuff. Nice. So, so when you go to the website, you'll see various companies, but then they also have a little Brigade Games section. Uh -huh. um, and it's interesting because they cover a lot of periods that some people may not have seen um, but when they do go into the sections that people have seen like the Napoleonics uh, they've got some great sculptors so I think most of the stuff comes from Paul Hicks. Is, yeah. this, is this the Napoleonics? This is the Napoleonics and if you start opening them so if you open these now well, the, website, what you want. the website and images aren't the greatest in the world so they yes. are going to be a little bit small but if you open him so okay. the British Rifle Veteran Officer anybody who's watched a TV series starring a certain Sean Bean may recognize some of these people so that is uh, the one-eyed, balding, toothless Sweet William yes. uh, who joins them in the later <laughs> seasons. They also have ones based on Sharp himself and his chosen men. So you will see Darrow, Mali. where are we? There we go. So there's Dara These and two? Sean. Yeah, I shouldn't have to tell you. You should just be able to go, oh, look, that's Darrow, Mali and uh, Sean <laughs> Bean right off the bat. So I say the, that, the pictures are quite TV. Oh, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. The, 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 it's it's one, of the, one of the problems with some of the smaller independent Websites, yes. the websites aren't all mm -hmm. singing, all dancing, but their Napoleonic stuff is gorgeous. Like I say, all Paul Hicks, they do some beautiful stuff for some of the other World War II areas that you wouldn't see often. So, and even World War One, so they do like Palestine and Gallipoli, so you get Lawrence of Arabia. In fact, there he is there. Oh, there he is. I'm pretty sure that's a, I'm not entirely certain, but it looks like a cobblestone casting. Uh -huh. um, so maybe Mark sculpted that. If not, it's a very similar style. Mm -hmm. But throughout, they do an awful lot of stuff throughout various. Um, small esoteric periods of history but then they also do weird stuff so they do like space goblins or no wars 20 no wars 28 mil no wars are particularly good <laughs> i think we you could, might like these i might like them cavalry yeah oh yes you know, if you're going to be a being about like lawrence i'll right, have to see these gnomes let's yeah. check the gnomes right, check out right, the gnome let me see if I can this is our chance to gnomes. build the whole gnome <laughs> army <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 so shop where, where have we gone to here we're in yeah. the gnomes all right well scroll back up you've, you've you're so keen on scrolling down all the time. Oh my oh god, they do Irish gnomes. Irish yes. gnomes, Swiss gnomes, gnomes, American gnomes. But this is why I'm saying you can't just scroll straight okay, down okay. in there. So the Irish gnomes are leprechauns, but you also get Irish gnomish cavalry. So <laughs> leprechauns mounted on, on wolves. I, I have to check out. Well, uh, we're all talking gnomes and it's zombies. Yeah, it's zombies. It's zombies. So. Where do you want, Jerry? Well, I want to see the Irish gnomes. So show me my leprechauns with Irish wolfhound calf. Okay. There's a whole truckload of them there. Yeah, let's open this up. Aren't those just little Lepretians? Little Lepretians? Look at them. <laughs> Every man oh, with a shillelagh. Everyone with a shillelagh yeah. is right. Everyone with a shillelagh. The, the British gnomes are a more diverse bunch of sort of <laughs> mm -hmm. um, American War of Independence and tricorn hat wearing fellas and all uh -huh. you know, so there's some just ridiculous things. There's, a gnome on a wolf hound. Yep. Is, it, oh, is it a wolf hound or is it a rabbit? Yeah, it's a wolf hound. Oh no, it's a rabbit. Is it? No. Is it? Is, is it, it a, a wolf hound? I think, uh, I think it, it's a rabbit. It's got a big long tongue, so it's probably a wolf hound. All right, I thought yeah. that was a carrot. Uh, right, but then my identification of phallic shaped uh, vegetables is not images. as fine tuned as uh, Justin's. Uh, uh, no images. Tonight. Sorry. <laughs> Tonight. <laughs> but throw open the British gnomes. Orange men gnomes. Hang on right. a second. Yeah, let's, let's have a look. Oh my oh, god. Sold! <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous. <laughs> okay. The Sasha's father won. <laughs> so yeah, so Brigade Games, from the esoteric to the bizarre to the downright hilarious. Uh, oh, hang on. Uh, there, here's one with a lamb bag. There you go. That's too small to be a lamb bag. So it is. It's just, it's just a bass drum. It's just a bass, yeah. Mm. They don't even let people march with lamb bags anymore. I know. They're just too ridiculously big. <laughs> and too so. bloody loud. So yeah, Brigade Games, definitely people. And if anybody's into the Napoleonics and 28 mil, I went, I already owned all of the stuff. But whenever we were in Historicon last year, I got a ping from uh, Martin off the site going, if you're going to be going past the Brigade Games stand, can you pick me up? 
Sean and Dara yeah. for Sharp, and, and I also picked up Brian Cox. Remember Brian Cox played um, the spy master for Wellington in the TV series? No, they, so they, not they Brian Cox the scientist? No, no, <laughs> the real Brian <laughs> Cox. <laughs> Brian oh, Cox. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, that's, well, that's the chosen man, and each one is based off the, no, that's the second, that's just the rifleman. There's a chosen man section, each one is based on the actor who played the character in the TV series. Yeah. The, yeah, it's definitely, if people are into the Napoleonics and into their sharp, or even just want something to paint up, like to do um, they're definitely the way to go. Happy days. Yep. Right. Excellent. Check choice, it out. Uh, BrigadeGames.3dcartstores.com mm. mm. I think we'll be down there somewhere, courtesy of Ryan, yes. who will hate me for saying <laughs> that. Right. It's time to update, yeah? Coming to you from the centre of Northwestern Europe, Covering board games, war games, card games, and all that sh you love. It's the Muck News. <laughs> ben, what's going on in the world? Let's have uh, some non coronavirus news, please, man. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, we'll try and do that. Uh, but so we're starting off with uh, the guys at Warlord Games, and they are going to be bringing a new version of Victory at Sea to the mm -hmm. tabletop very soon. Pre orders went live for it this week. Um, the game used to be uh, published by Mongoose, um, if you remember it back in the day, but uh, Warlord are bringing it back with a whole new range of models and rules and all sorts of bits and pieces in order for you to play out uh, both conflicts in the Pacific and in the Atlantic. Um, a lot of the focus is around their new start step, which is coming out, which is called Battle for the Pacific, which includes um, fleets for both the US Navy and the IGN as well. And they can be used, uh, sorry, IJN, that's very that, important. That there. makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> not, not the video game website. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it also includes all the different components that you need to play. So you get a little mat to play out your games on, you get the two fleets, you get all the dice, you get all the cards, you get all the bits and pieces, you get the rule book. There's a huge set of scenarios in, in there as well, so you can follow through an easy how to play guide, getting you started through to full on amazing games where you're having you know, two huge fleets against each other on the tabletop. On top of the starter set, they're also doing a whole bunch of different starter sets for our, the different navies themselves. So if you just want to pick up the rulebook later on down the line and then get your own specific navy, then you can do that. So they're going to have a set for the US, one for the, U uh, the IJM, one for the Royal Navy, and one for the Kriegsmarines. Uh, so if you want to play out the fights across, you know, in the Pacific, you know, with the U-boats and stuff like that, you know, maybe if you've seen the trailer for the new Greyhound film, then you want to try and rec recreate that on the tabletop. So you've got some options there too. They have also going to be working on uh, a whole bunch of name ships, so very important iconic ones from the period as well. And there's a couple of pre-order bonuses in the mix as well um, this week, specifically while Warlord Games are holding it on their web store at the moment. Um, looks pretty interesting. I know a lot of people have been talking about, it'd be very cool to see how the mechanics actually work for this, because now a lot of people are wanting to try uh, sort of World War Two naval war games in yeah. this scale, so it'd be really interesting to see how that plays out. But um, we'll wait and see what the articles are in the near future, as we'll go into more depth about the game itself. But, I but yeah, wonder, so, will they have the turpets? Well, that's the, it's probably the turpets are the Bismarck, same class of ship. Yeah, so it's um, I'd like to I'd like to see the turpets and actually get the turpets out to see and see what it might have done. Well. Mm. Yeah. Well, instead of sitting in a, a fjord, was it? It was sat in a Nor Norwegian fjord yeah. for, for the war. Yeah, pined. Yeah. It just pined away. It just, it just, it just wanted to get out and do something. It is interesting that they've gone for the, well, it's not that interesting probably that they've gone for the Pacific because mm -hmm. we were talking about this uh, yesterday on mm. Discord and the biggest encounter, the biggest engagement in World War II as far as a naval fleet engagement, it was like the Battle of Lafayette, wow. which was Pacific. Mm. Yeah. Which was ridiculously big yes because we're going oh that there may be you know you think a couple of dozen ships aside uh -huh. several hundred ships aside oh, really something like two hundred thousand um square miles of engagement uh -huh. and, and and you're going i've never heard of that before and it was just because i seen this coming up in the news it was like i wonder what the biggest game was mm. uh, or what the, the biggest, biggest engagement, the biggest yeah. battle was and you're going yeah. mm. oh my lord that's much bigger why does nobody ever talk about this ridiculous engagement mm. so i've picked the wrong theater you wouldn't have the serpents in, in the pacific no anyway. you'd so be, you'd it was in Atlantic. Yamato. yeah mm -hmm. so for the japanese there that big was one. A, that was a big one yeah yeah, yeah. It's, big, mm -hmm. it's interesting although have you seen the documentary about the aircraft carrier submarine that the japanese built during world war ii yes that was interesting i, I have seen that an aircraft carrier submarine yes yeah, so um, it was a submarine yeah and they were able to raise it up and then there was uh, little 
with little, a hanger on top, do, with a doodle buggy little aircraft on it with yeah. folding wings. And they folded uh -huh. the wings out, and then it, it, so, they yeah, they could so, it. so this aircraft was sitting on top of the of the hull. The there whole was time. a hanger, was, a sealed hanger oh, on top. It yeah. up. So it opened up to the runway right. on top of the mm -hmm. submarine. So very James Bondy there. Yeah, yes. uh, but it was like the biggest submarine of all time when they built it. Because it, yeah, it's just it had to be that big to get the damn thing launched. Mm -hmm. Well, there it's you like, go. It's like the it's like the what was it subterrains that apparently the the country looked at building too. Mm -hmm. Which are basically submarines under the ground. Mm. They were they were trying to come up with well, like, basically like channel the drill tunnel, like channel tunnel tunnelers, uh -huh. but for combat scenarios, and they called them what was it? Um, subterrains. Uh, subterrains. Yeah. yeah, that is genius. Interesting. I'm pretty sure I've seen the foot. You never have to fly again. Or ninjas or? use those huh? against the. You never turtles. have to fly again. No, a subterrain <laughs> sign. Amazing. <laughs> Imagine like if you if you had if you had like a what, what would it be a fleet. Of, of subterrains, but or? you go really slowly. Uh huh. Yeah. But it, it, you know, undermining. <laughs> but if you think about it, undermining has been, has been a part of warfare for thousands of years, mm -hmm. um, or where they've undermined um, castle walls and things like that. Mm -hmm. If you had, like, say, for example, well, I mind you, it took a lot of years actually to cut the Channel Tunnel. It did. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of laser of guidance and stuff to try and make sure you're on target. Yeah, you're hardly going to drop a, a subterrain. In, uh, uh, in one of the French <laughs> ports and then bring it out under the Houses of Parliament in any reasonable amount of time. They come um, up after the war. Ah, oh, crap, we missed it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it, have you watched Jack Boots on Whitehall? No. Right. It's basically the World War II version of Team America World Police. Okay. It is funny as hell because they actually have a, I think it's like a Panzer IV with a massive drill on the back of it, and it's them drilling through to England, and they actually come up in, uh, I think it's Trafalgar Square. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's really funny to see. There you go. There's one to watch. Right. Next up, mm -hmm. Aliens is back. We have a board yeah. game from Gale Force 9. Yeah, so uh, there are sort of a couple of previews, a couple of interesting teasers here and there last year at um, Battlefront's open day of the Aliens board game. But now we've got the first proper look at the sort of layout for the game, the miniatures and all that kind of thing that Gale Force Army could be working on, with a release for this coming around Q3 of this year. So the whole idea of the game is it's going to be a cooperative affair, where you're going to be playing as the classic iconic Marines from the Aliens film, as well as Ripley. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be taking on the Xenomorphs, as they flood through the facility of Hadley's Hope, trying to take you down. So that you're going to be playing, as I said, together, trying to complete a whole bunch of different scenarios in order to try and stay alive and survive your encounters. Um, as well as the core game, which is going to be set to come out, you know, as I said, in Q3 this year, there's also going to be two expansions coming out as well. Uh, so the expansions are going to be the Ultimate Badasses expansion, which adds in a whole bunch of additional Marines for you to use in your games. So you've got a whole suite of different options when you sit down to play. And also the Stay Away From Her, You Bitch expansion, uh, which comes with uh, Ripley in her power loader going up against the Alien Queen as well. So we've, we're light on the actual mechanical details as of yet. But hopefully, Gale Force Nine are going to be putting together a couple of articles in the near future, sort of diving into a little bit more about how the game plays. Uh, they did a whole bunch of uh, really cool videos um, talking about the mechanics of Dune when that came out not too long ago. So hopefully, we're going to see exactly the same kind of thing with the Aliens board game. But if you like Aliens, this seems like a pretty awesome uh, one to deal with, uh, dive into. And Gale Force Nine do a pretty good job with their sort of IP and stuff. Um, so it'll be very cool to see how this comes together. Yeah, I've got to say, I love aliens. the sculpt for Newt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Aliens, <that's> also neat. <laughs> um, one of my favourite movies of all time. Mm. Absolutely loved it. I think uh, as a piece of uh, a piece of sci-fi, it just right up there. But then I'm I'm, I'm Aliens and Predator, the originals. Mm. Uh, it's like, ah. I love how the ultimate badass expansion contains the most badass of all of the characters in there, which is one half of my two dads, the uh -huh. Will and Yutani Corporation guy. Yeah. <laughs> I like how they go, he's an ultimate badass. Yes. What, what did you do exactly? Well, I trapped the lead character in a room with a face on because I wanted to impregnate her and the kids. I he, was, he was the most we, hateful character. He was no, just he's an awful. ultimate badass. No, because no, he'd been the hateful character expansion. Yes. He's not he's an ultimate badass. <laughs> yeah, he's the hateful character badass. expansion. Yeah. And Ben, let me give you a little insight as to how the game plays. There will be lots of aliens and you'll shoot them dead. Oh, yeah. Do you know what? I, I hope we get... Game over, man. Game over. <laughs> I hope we get to place those um, automated guns turrets. and the turrets yeah. and stuff. Well, let, let, have, have a look ever. at the board here because you might get lucky. You might actually see them on there. Yeah. Oh, I can see nothing except space. I, I think I can embiggen. 
That's better. Uh, one, cool. one of the cool things about this as well is that it's going to be one of those board games which is just eminently quotable. So you get every time you sit down to play, people are going to be talking about game over, man, and all that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. yeah. it's going to be cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited for this one. Love it. There was other uh, board game news uh, from Guild Wars yeah. 9. They, they had almost like a massive news drop uh, during Gamma. Um, uh, what, what other bits and pieces came out, Ben? Yeah, cool. So there's uh, two more bits of sort of big board game news from their sort of collection. The first of these is around uh, their sort of cooperative, semi-cooperative game set in the Doctor Who universe, which is Time of the Daleks. And this is that they're going to be doing a new core set for the game, which uses the 13th Doctor. So um, if you've been watching the series with Jodie Whittaker at the helm, then you've got her now as the sort of central character. And um, the game is basically the same. It just includes that new version of the character in there, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. They're also working on a whole bunch of new expansions as well. So there's a bunch of expansions which add in a whole um, set of the different Doctors throughout all of time and space. And there's also going to be two sets of companion boxes too. So if you want to add those miniatures of the companions into the game, you can use them to help boost the Doctors as they go about trying to stop the Daleks from taking over everything. Uh, And I actually think the miniatures they've done for this, the board game companions they've done, are actually looking really good. Um, they vary on sort of par with the characters and the, you know, the actors and the actresses that played them in the show. And uh, I think if you are someone who really loves Doctor Who, you're a bit of a Whovian, this could be a pretty awesome one to dive into and have a go at. But, yeah. Love it. Cool. Love it. What else, Ben? Uh, so the other one is uh, one of Justin's favourites, and this is there's going to be a re-release of Spartacus, which is getting itself a new core box. Yes! Uh, Put it there, Justin! <laughs> Boom! One of the best Let's Plays we ever did was myself, Lloyd and Lance, sitting down to play this. Because I won it! Oh. <laughs> this, is, this is probably one of the most played games by the On Tabletop team. Anytime we go on tour anywhere, you can be guaranteed this man has that box packed. <laughs> it's one of the few games I can say, and proudly say, I have played to destruction. Yes. The box is basically being held together right now by a full roll of scotch tape. Yeah, it, it, it is. It, I'm so, so glad to see the return of this game. It, it's, mm. it, it, as game mechanics and stuff go, this, this is just right up there. Well, right I mean, like, I, I remember whenever this game first came out, we actually started playing like halfway through a game, one lunch break, coming mm-hmm. back the next day, finishing it in the next lunch break. Yeah. And it was just, it's so easy. The mechanics all gel together so well for this game. I'm so happy right now. And the Little fact we came out. The fact, Justin, that the, 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 one of the whole premises of the game is we get to dick each other over. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's, all right. I, I, I see some folks out there when they review games like this and go, I don't like gotcha mechanics, but yeah. everybody can go with a gotcha in this. Everybody yes. has the ability to go after that, that sneaky little hit. You know. Yes. I also had a look at the first unboxing we did. Yep. Damn, I was skinny. Right. What, what, what has changed, Ben? Uh, so um, one of the big things, obviously, with this game is that they've changed the art style. Um, so the original version of the game that came from Game Force 9 was obviously themed around the Spartacus uh, TV show. This one they've gone with a different artist, and they've also designed a whole bunch of new art assets for the game. But the very core mechanics of it are all pretty much the same. A lot, a few of the houses have changed around as well. So um, each of them with their own unique powers and stuff, they've all been tweaked. But the very core basic of the mechanics is still there. So it's all about you know running this house of gladiators um, trying to bid for the right gladiators and dicking each other over as you guys were saying and then also there's that element of actual combat and arena combat on the sands of the arena too so that's been there but the big main change as i was saying has been sort of like the artwork really uh, and hopefully we're going to see some expansions in the future for this as well that could be very cool um, bringing in some of those houses and all those sort of legendary gladiators and that kind of thing in the future as well but yeah it uh, looks very cool I, as i say i've played this game a couple of times with justin had a really really good time of it obviously you guys played the let's play and that was really fun as well it seems like a really awesome game to, for them to sort of bring back and give a new lease of life to. Well, I, I remember the first time we had the, the crew from Firelock Games over here, I took them through it. They didn't even make it home to America before they had a copy bought and were playing it in the hotel. <laughs> nice, nice. So that, right. that makes me happy. Uh, tomorrow or Sunday? Sunday. Sunday. Again. Sunday. Yeah, so <laughs> on Sunday, um, uh, uh, for the, our Cult of Games members, so just a little recap for you. Um, the only reason we're able to continue this this show and the weekenders and stuff is because of um, like a few select individuals who have joined basically our our supporters network, which yeah. is called the Cult of Games. See you right there. You you're helping. 
And you over there, yeah. you're helping. That, that one there, Lloyd. See that yeah. other bald one back there? Looks like Justin, you're helping. Yeah. Uh, that, that's actually one of my favorites. <laughs> and you with the beard, magnificent. Anyway, the Cult of Games members, um, they, they, they help us out by by paying a, a small fee, which is less than a cup of coffee these days. Yeah. Used Three, to be a cup of coffee and a muffin. Yeah, now you don't get the muffin anymore. Inflation. But, but we appreciate the cup of coffee. Three seventy nine a month. For three seventy nine a month, first and foremost, they keep all of this going. They keep the lights on. They, they help us pay for the servers and uh, for the, all the bandwidth and stuff that we use. We utterly rely on it. it it's what allows us to, to retain our in, uh, independence. And these days, it basically is what allows us to actually just keep operating. So we're always, always yep. trying to reach out to you guys to try and get um, uh, more members to come in and join us in the Cult of Games. And it's even more crucial now because we're getting to that age, we're going to start needing Botox. <laughs> <laughs> and that's expensive stuff. Uh, so, bionics, man, bionics. <laughs> uh, well, we have extra content and stuff like that that we, uh, that we create and we share with the, the Cult of Games members. Um, on Sunday, we have a show called XLBS. Um, it, it's a it's a relaxed and fun affair between ourselves and the Cult of Games members, and um, yeah, we we have a, a cool topic we're going to hit this Sunday where we're going to be yeah. looking um, at, at the implications of what Gale Force Nine have done with Spartacus mm. and what the implications are potentially elsewhere in the uh, yeah, it, for, for other for games. other similar yeah. games. We, we, anyway, we've got that. And we've got a few other cool things to talk about on Sunday. We'd really love it if you took the opportunity to come over to uh, on tabletop.com and signed up as a Cult of Games member, join our inner circle, help us continue, mm. and yeah, just basically be awesome. Right. We got a chance to have a sit down mm. with um, uh, Voodoo Games, yes. who have brought a Kickstarter called Night Tales. Hey everybody, myself and Jerry are joined in the studio by Andre from Voodoo Games and today we're going to be talking about Night Tales, uh, the latest game that these guys are working on. Andre, welcome to the show, buddy. Hi. Nice to be here. <laughs> and yeah, happy that we find the time to talk about Night Tales and our company a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's, let's jump straight into it. What is Night Tales? Uh, Night Tales is basically our fifth board game. Um, Voodoo Games was founded in 2014, and since then we have produced four other board games. Um, the best one that are the most known so far might be Carnivore Koala, which was our first game ever. And it was becoming quite popular, and we had a Kickstarter campaign also running for this one. And uh, we've been the first German board game funded by Kickstarter at this time, so that was quite a success for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And since then, we've continued with other board games uh, like Shibalba. Then we had a campaign running for Isles of Terror, which was our last big project. And in between, we had another game called Flouts. <laughs> and now we are um, here with Night Tales, currently running a Kickstarter campaign. And it's running pretty well at the moment. So yeah, that's our fifth board game, or will be our fifth board game, because it's already funded. So we are should be on the safe side. And in Night Tales, if, uh, if you want to hear a brief overview, mm -hmm. we have um, we came up with a with a pretty general generic um, background story so that people can make up their own ideas to it. So the basic story of the game uh, would be that um, the kingdom it's not said which kingdom, but the kingdom is at war uh, with some evil forces, and the king has been slain. And the only heir to the kingdom has been heavily wounded. So um, the players, they take on the roles of different knights um, with some individual knight powers. And they have um, rescued the heir from battle and um, they fled to a remote village and are hiding there. And they have to stay there for about three days and three nights and defend the village and the heir um, against the monster hordes that roam the night and try to attack the village. Mm -hmm. So the game itself is for one to four players. So you, you can play it solo, of course, um, and then you can play it cooperatively or um, semi-cooperatively. Mm -hmm. And the semi-cooperatively part was the actual idea of the game. Um, the author, Stefan Tizer Hansen, is the, the author of the game. He approached us uh, at Spiel 2018. And since then, we were working on the different 
yeah, fine tunings for the game, and we also incorporated the cooperative, fully cooperative mode and the solo modes, and everything works pretty well at this stage. So, yeah, that's something to consider that you have all these three different play modes, and for the game duration, currently we uh, we aim for 60 minutes. But if you are new to the game, you would maybe need about 19 minutes. Mm -hmm. So that's well, the overall yeah. idea. Well, moment. starting off with um, the actual the core mechanics that that sort of stay the same, or the the core setup for the game, that doesn't change depending on what mode you're playing. It is a tower defense, um, but it, it has some interesting. It's basically you can call it a tower defense, but it has some. Right. Yeah, it, it has interesting variations. So, uh, if you talk us through what a, a standard sort of game term would be, because it, it is split into these two phases, we've got your day phase followed by your night phase. So, correct. So, um, every game starts with a day phase, and each round is basically split into a day and into a following night phase. So, during the day phases, um, the players they can uh, purchase market cards on the market side of the game board and there are different types of market cards their players can purchase um, we have six different market card types like weapons armor we have some companions we have some animals then we have magic trinkets and uh, relics and then there is a seventh item type shown at the back of the market side um, leaning against the market board it's a vertical board standing there mm -hmm. and um, these are the trophies the trophies are purchased in a different way than the other market cards so they are somehow special and the players will just simply take alternating actions and spend gold to purchase different items um, and the or companions also and everything they purchase they can then use during the night phase um, because they all all the market cards have some supportive effects that will help you to get through the night and once players have finished their purchase purchasing items um, they can stop at any time they like or they have to stop when they don't have any gold um, left so they will move their miniature to the night side of the board which mm -hmm. is in front of the palisades of the village and um, placing their knights in a spot for the battlefield mm -hmm. And then when the last player moved to the night side of, of the game board, then the night phase will begin. And during the night phase, there will be um, different setups depending on the difficulty the players are choosing for their games. So we have three difficulty levels that you can choose from. And um, these will tell you how many champions and minions will appear in each of the night phases. So these are two monster types that we have. We have minions, which are the weaker monster types. And mm -hmm. then we have champions, which are a bit stronger. And if you play at a, an easy level, you will have in the first night, we will have one champion and eight minions. And you will draw them from two different decks, like the minion deck and the champion deck. Mm -hmm. um, but they both have the same backside so you will you cannot tell which is which one is the champion and which one is are the minions you will shuffle them all and then you will place the nine cards on the battlefield um, side and then you will draw um, one of the three bosses from the core game there mm -hmm. will be more later on uh, with the expansions but there are three in the core game you will draw one and this will determine the boss for that night so it could be the war chief um, it could be a leech lord or it could be uh, the wood witch and this makes up for your the for the monster horde that you have to fight and then we have that night side we have it separated into ranks and lanes mm -hmm. so there are three ranks um and there are three lanes and the first rank for each night phase is then revealed which means to flip uh, over the, the the monster cards and you will see three monsters uh, that you can attack and some mm -hmm. of them have special effects like they are moving to the back of their lane and then when once they do that they will shift the other monsters to the front and each time a new monster arrives in the first rank that is still unrevealed you will reveal that as well so these shifting effects will have the effect that there are, will be more monsters revealed and also they will support each other with rank and yeah. lane effects so you will have synergies between the monster cards yeah, that, and that's, that's something that I was interested in whenever I seen it. You're not just dealing with the first 
uh, or the closest rank to your heroes. Mm. The fact when you flip over a card, the card might be um, a harpy and the harpy flies and will fly to a back rank or the orc shaman uh, who will retreat to a back rank to mm. cast thus pushing somebody new into the slot that they've vacated yeah. so you're having to deal with the most immediate threat but you also have to deal with the cards to the rear ranks that have now become uncovered as well mm. so you're not just dealing with how do we combat this first rank you're also having to think about how do we deal with this first rank plus possibly somebody in the second rank and maybe a couple of them in the third rank um it's it's a quite a nice way to do it that it's it's engineered that the unit types are smart enough to take up their appropriate spot on the battlefield. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and when you're playing with the monsters, do you um you were saying that the, the nine creatures that go into the, the actual combat, they're drawn randomly. Are they mixed then? So can you get spe- can you get mixes of orcs and undead and beasts or do you draw from specific packs at one time? Um, no, you will have a mixture of everything. So um, all the minions and all the champions um, will contain three factions in total, but they are totally mixed up. And um, it's meant that way that you will draw more than only orcs or, mm. or only beasts or undead. You will have, or you should have, most likely always a mixture of those. Um, that's important be for the for the game effects as well, and also for fulfilling quests. Mm. Um, which you can do in the semi-cooperative uh, play. You have quests which tell you you the first one defeating a beast or an undead monster will gain um, additional bonus Valor mm-hmm. points at the end of the game. So um, it's it's on purpose that that these are all mixed. So it adds much more to the game. Yeah. So even though the, even though that the boss may be the orc warlord, that doesn't necessarily mean you won't be having to deal with werewolves and giant spiders or centaurs or whatever whatever else comes sort of steaming out of the forest at night. Yes, correct. Um, The boss has a different effect. I mean, the boss clearly belongs to one of the factions, um, Mm -hmm. but the boss itself does not have a faction symbol on his own. He has just the boss symbol, which is important for the set collection aspect of the game, Mm -hmm. which we can talk about later. But um, the boss is having, or all the bosses are having an effect that they Um, They will be outside the battlefield when you start the night phase, so they are also just like the trophies on the market side, they are standing vertically against the forest board at the Mm. other end of the game board. And as long as they are standing there, they are out of, um, they are not on the battlefield, so no one can attack the boss. Um, uh, But the boss can get stronger during the night phase by rolling doom symbols that Mm -hmm. will increase the doom track of the boss so he gets stronger. And once you cleared the third rank out of monsters, which mm-hmm. means either you clear the first rank and then everyone, sh- every other monster shifts to shifts the, down, to the yeah. first rank. The last rank will be cleared and then there will be space for the boss to enter the battlefield. So then he will move um, onto the battlefield. And the special ability about the bosses is every time they move to a new rank, they will cause uh, what we call lane damage. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they cause lane damage in each lane where there is a monster of a specific type. For the War Chief, it would be every lane that contains at least one orc monster would suffer one lane damage. Mm-hmm. And that's how the monster or the bosses relate to their own faction monsters. Right. And if they would only be orcs, you would have a hard time because this lane damage will destroy your palisades and ultimately your village itself and you cannot repair that in any way so um, if there would only be orcs uh, lying there when the war chief is moving you will have a hard time yeah, because then every it. time you would suffer lane then damage so it, it kind of so. makes sense for the the puzzle picking aspect of this to actually look at your target priorities depending on your boss as well then Correct. The idea is that you will have to think about which of the monsters that are currently revealed you want to take out first. There might be monsters having a rank effect or a lane effect and you want to take them out first because it makes it easier to attack the others Mm -hmm. because they are not buffed by by them. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, you will realize, okay, when we take that that specific monster, the boss will move. And if he does so, then we will suffer two lane damage because there are still two orcs lying on the Mm -hmm. battlefield. So this is all adding to the mechanic to the puzzle uh, that you have to somehow resolve during each night phase and it will be different all the time 
And also what makes it very interesting is um, in the semi-cooperative play mode, uh, you sometimes want to have or to defeat a specific monster or monster type mm -hmm. because you will still need it to complete your set collection. And even so, it might make more sense to attack um, another a different monster to prevent the lane damage. The players might just risk it and attack or think, yeah, be egoistic and, and, and take the one that they need for their own set. Yeah. So these are always the choices and hard choices that you have to make because in the end, when you lose your, your village um, buildings, when they are all destroyed, then none of the players win. So um, you always have this tension of, should I do something for the team um, or do I think about my own goals? But if I do so, we might all lose and then it won't help me at all. So that's all, yeah. Yeah. So speaking then of the heroes, um, there are four in the starting set uh, and they each have a sort of a, a slightly unique feel to them. So um, Taranos is very much about cleaving. We have uh, Breda up here on, on screen at the moment. She um, allows you to ignore a single sword result on a monster die. So there are specific dice in the game that are... Um, ruled by both the, the monsters and the knights but uh they've, they've all come with these player battle boards as well if you can talk us through the the mechanics behind them because i quite like how they've been set up where it's not just one track or rather it is one track but the one track maps multiple things in this case it's both health and fatigue for each of the knights Yes, correct. Um, so as you said, every player has uh, their own battle board showing their own character. They are basically uh, more or less the same, but they all have one different knight ability that they can use, which makes them a bit individual. And the rest of the character building is then being done by purchasing the, the market cards uh, during the day phase. So you mm -hmm. can build your own character with new effects. And this one track that you mentioned, yeah, um, the, the, the idea behind is that you... Um, you have these three tokens. The fatigue one uh, is always being placed on the spot that corresponds to the amount of players currently playing. So there are three different spots, one for four players, one for three mm -hmm. players, and one for two players. If you play solo, it will have a different effect, but we can maybe talk about that yeah. later. So um, the, the fatigue token uh, will be put on one of the starting positions, and it will move to the right for each each time you you want to attack a monster so basically um, when you attack a monster in the first rank you will need to spend one fatigue so it moves once to the right sure and if you attack a monster in the second or third rank you will need to spend two or even three fatigue then you will have the health um, token which starts on a green spot with a blood drop and this one is, is showing your current health and every time you lose health it moves down or to the left basically mm -hmm. towards your fatigue token and um, you can play uh, during the night phase or you can have as many actions as long as the green and the red, the fatigue and the health token do not meet. Mm -hmm. If they touch, uh, you are out of the night phase and you ran out of actions. Uh, of course, if you, if you are spending your last action by moving the fatigue token so that it touches your health token, you get to do this last action, which we call a heroic deed, because um, it doesn't at this time it doesn't matter how much damage you would receive, since the the health token can never cross the or move over the fatigue token. Mm -hmm. And then there is the third one, which we call wrath. Uh, it's the blue token, which always starts on a specific position based on your um, starting position for the day phase. So. The starting positions on the day phase give you either plus one, plus two, or plus three RAS to start with in the night phase. And um, this is a special um, ability. Every player can spend RAS to either re-roll their own night dice or um, to add a new night die. Yeah. So the way it works is you are moving it towards your health token. And as the same mechanic with the fatigue and health one, um, you can only move it as far as it touches your health token. And yeah, the, the idea is if you lose health, then you will make up more space and you can use up more wrath because you lose health, you build up more wrath and mm -hmm. then you can use it as kind of a compensation uh, and spend it on rerolls and um, new dice yeah. that you can add. Also, that, that's an interesting thing that we hadn't really mentioned. Um, when you come out of the market phase, the people who the people who get in early enough get their stuff bought and then move to a defensive position 
uh, essentially start with more wrath. Whereas if somebody has um, succumbed to their fatigue the previous night and got knocked out, they always count as last out of the market. So they always end up with the least wrath. Is that correct? It's the other way, basically. Oh, the other way. Um, right. When you, the first player that's be ended ends his night phase mm -hmm. will be um, put in the last spot of the day phase right. but will get the most wrath he will start with plus three wrath that's mm -hmm. like a, a small catch-up mechanism because um, starting with plus three wrath allows you uh, either three re-rolls or to add one die and have uh, another reroll because rerolls cost one wrath and uh, adding a die costs two wrath mm -hmm. so um, the idea behind that is if you are the first player that's ending the night phase um, you are most likely the ones with the least gold because gold is earned by defeating monsters or damaging monsters mm -hmm. and if the other players are staying in the night phase much longer than you then they will basically have a better chance to collect more gold than you will have so um, this last player um, the the advantage is that you will um, have this wrath and on the other side the last player since he can buy less items will most likely also be the one that ends their day phase at um, at first and mm -hmm. will then become the starting player for the night phase because the first one ending their day phase will be the starting player in the night phase, which then means it might be um, the first one being able to fulfill the daily quest during the night phase. Yeah. Like he has maybe the first chance defeating a beast and then that's a little bit of a catch-up mechanism because he gets a benefit on the night mm -hmm. phase then, having that's, the first pick on the monster. That's lovely. Yeah, I, I, I like the the balancing aspects of that. We've mentioned a couple of times, we've touched a couple of times on the different types of games. So um, we've been talking about the fact that it can be played semi-cooperatively, fully cooperatively, or solo. Um, do you want to explain the differences between them? Because there are quest and renown cards that are available mm -hmm. when you're playing um, semi-cooperatively. And, and those really, at that point, it does make a big difference as to how much wrath you ha have and how when you're going in and going out as well because you get the abilities then to get those quests and get the renown earlier than others so yeah. there are um three separate decks is it uh, depending on the type of game you're playing whether it's solo semi or fully cooperative correct um what we've been talking about now the whole time was more likely the the semi cooperative um play mode because that explains most of the game or, or the main mechanics and uh, in this mode you will have to have the most valor points in the end so basically mm -hmm. the semi-cooperatively version you are all fighting together because you have to otherwise you will have no chance to um, to survive all three nights mm -hmm. and so the valor points they are collected um, in different ways uh, and these things you will not have during the solo or cooperative play but in the semi-cooperative um, play mode, you will have different ways of collecting these Valor points. Uh, one, you, one thing is um, by fulfilling quests. So fulfilling quests will give you bonus points at the end of the um, game. And the first one, fulfilling a quest, will place a crest token. That's uh, the player tokens they have showing their coat of arms. Mm -hmm. So they will place a crest token at the first spot of fulfilling a quest and get the most points. And then it can be completed by a second player and by a third. Uh, if a fourth player doesn't manage to complete it in time he will not get nothing mm -hmm. so there are these quests um, which are also tracking the day rounds in which you are in because each day you will reveal one of the three um quest cards from yeah. the three decks and then in the night phase you will have the renown cards and they have the mechanism on on one side they tell you how many monsters are coming on the other side when you turn around you will have these uh, trackers which give you it experience uh, extra valor points for hmm. uh, how you end your night phase. So if you end your night phase with your health token being in the green area of the player board, you get more rewards, valor points than when you end the night phase being in your yellow or red yeah. health um, area. So and then you will have uh, the kind of set collection, which is important for the semi-cooperative mode. Mm -hmm. um, you get bonus points for collecting different types of items. So you can collect different or, or more than one weapon you can have three weapons if you like but it's mm -hmm. all one type it's all a weapon type so you will try to also collect armor and have all the other types as well because if you can manage to have all the six different market card types you will get the most 
Valor points at the end. And if you can also manage to get the seventh type, like the trophy, hmm. then you will have the the maximum bonus points for collecting a set of market cards. And the same is on the monster side. Um, you can collect different six different kinds of monsters. There's a minion and a champion for each of the three factions. So these mm -hmm. are the six different monsters that you can um, collect. And the seventh one, just like the trophies, as would be the boss. Um, so that's the seventh type of monster you can collect. And that's becoming pretty important when playing um, in this mode because they can make up for a lot of, of um, Valor points in the end. But um, you can't forget all about the Valor points when it comes to solo or the cooperative play. So in the cooperative play, you will exchange the quest and the renown cards, and you will have what we called uh, oath cards. Mm -hmm. They have specific um, abilities on them, yeah. which are supportive. And uh, the idea is that you have that you um, somehow benefit the cooperative play by having cards that can be used by any player at any time, um, and then help someone out in a specific situation where he cannot manage to to. Um, resolve that situation on his own in a, during an attack or whatever. So other players can uh, interact with these cards and help out each other. Um, the thing is, in a cooperative play, um, it's getting a little bit easier to play the game because um, you do not have to take care about who wants to defeat which monster because of the set collection bonus and whatever. You can all work together to find the best way to resolve the night phase puzzle. Mm -hmm. And therefore we have these additional um, difficulty levels because you can just say when we play cooperatively we, we raise the difficulty by one and see if we can still make it sure. so that's the uh, idea behind that and the last variant the solo um, variant is um, a little bit special because as you can see on the player boards um, there is no spot for the fatigue token for one player yeah um, so it means if you play with two players each player would have 14 fatigue to spend and these when you play with one player starting on the same position uh, the player would lack of an additional 14 fatigue mm -hmm. that would be there in a two-player game so he has the support of the villagers the Quest and the Renown cards would then be exchanged to the Villager cards. And these are special cards that you can use during the night by paying the Villagers with your gold. Yeah. So you can use their effects. And during the day and during the night phase, you will each reveal one of the Villagers on, at your own choice. You always see what they can do, but they will be deactivated. And you choose which ones to activate, and they will stay activated for the rest of the game. And then you can use them during the night and by spending your gold and yeah. you will earn that gold by defeating or damaging monsters and the other aspect about this is um, if you would play on your own you would basically have the chance to collect all the gold that's in the game which means you would end up with a lot of items that you can purchase um, later on and we didn't want to have that um uh, yeah, that uh, bottomless money big pet. amount. Mm. Yeah, so we we introduced that system and we it worked really well because you will spend your gold because you need the help of the villagers. Otherwise, you you cannot you have no chance during the night. So you will need to activate these villagers spending gold, and that leaves you uh, basically with the same amount of gold that you would have in a two player game or maybe even less if you need the more mm -hmm. you need the help of the villagers more often but that regulates itself pretty well and it also gives you this cool feeling of being the only knight in the village defending it yeah. and of course then the villagers will come to your support and help you out yeah rallying all the villagers to your side and, your pitchforks. and in some cases having to pay them for the privilege <laughs> you know yes the, the, the monk requires gold for the coffers of the church it makes perfect sense <laughs> yes. um, and if you do so you'll rest, you'll gain your fatigue um i really love the the concept behind not just the fact that there are multiple levels and difficulty levels you can play it at but just the the basis where you've gone well if we play the game this way um You've got the quest and renowned in the semi-cooperative and who can be top of the tree. Um, and then when you want to go fully cooperative, you take those cards away because that's not the issue anymore. But you have the oaths and then as a group, you decide which oath card is best for tonight um, that you can you can use collectively. Um, but then when you play solo, then it's, it's your night with the villagers. And um, 
even within that, just playing the same game uh, in three different ways, it changes it massively because it's not just tweaking the difficulty, it, it changes the the base mechanic behind uh, how the game is played. And I, I think that's fascinating. Um, it's a really interesting way of, of, of going about it. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about just the different ways people are going to think depending on the three modes. Yeah. Because if it's, if it's the, the semi-cooperative, it's, okay, how much can I do for my own personal glory but not mess it up for everybody? You know, and yeah. everybody's thinking that way. Then you go to the full co-op mode and it's just, okay, what is the absolute most efficient and best way that we can knock this all out? And then the third one, it's, for me, I always think solo modes are great for learning the game yourself or if you're, you're wanting just a different feel and flavor of story. Because like you said, with the villagers, it, it feels like they're rallying behind you. It feels like you are the hero of the story. Yes, yeah, definitely. So, Andre, um, currently that is the, the core set for the Kickstarter, but you've already um, been teasing some of the upcoming uh, expansion, The Last Stand, which introduces uh, four new knights, although I think we've only seen yes. two so far. Yeah, the third one will be revealed um, this evening, and then um, in total there will be four new knights that you can choose from. Um, they won't expand the player count. Uh, mm -hmm. We've been trying to get a fifth player to add it, but as you can see, the game board is, is a pretty um, fixed mechanism with yeah. these four, three lanes and four spots, and um, we had difficulties with the fifth player, so we got rid of the idea and said we, we don't want to spoil the game by adding somehow yeah. artificially a fifth player so there will be four new knights that you can choose from with different effects different looks and players can then choose whatever they like best or choose randomly out of these eight and in addition to that we will also add three new uh, monster factions with mm -hmm. that uh, last stand expansion so this will bring in a whole lot of uh, versatility to the whole game because you will always have three monster factions to deal with um, you will never have more than three mixed or shuffled together mm -hmm. there will always only be three factions and depending on these factions it will determine which bosses you will face during the three nights yeah um so these extra factions they can be you can basically swap them in for taking one out taking out the orcs yeah. putting in the barbarians or the demons, or the, the third one that we have not revealed yet, which will be starting to reveal on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So um, you get all these new kind of monsters with new effects, and also they will add a new mechanism, which we did not really talk about yet. Mm -hmm. We will have an update soon where we will explain more in detail what these different monster mechanisms like rank effects and lane effects will be. So in the base game, you have monsters with rank and lane effects. In the last stand expansion, you will have monsters with a global effect um, that will move back only once by mm -hmm. one rank, not to the end not, of the, rank, the rear, uh, yeah. lane, but mm -hmm. to the second one. And But they have um, they are easier to to attack because you only need to spend two for tick to get to them, but they have a global effect on all the revealed monsters, not only the ones in their lane or their rank, they affect every monster that is being revealed on the battlefield, so they can be pretty uh, hard to deal mm -hmm. with, so you will need to take them out first, most likely, or yeah, up to the players. But this is a new mechanic that will also be added, and yeah, if you have six different monster factions, there's a lot of combinations yeah. that you can choose from to play with and having all these different effects. And then, of course, it mixes up every night. No night will be the same because it, it's nine monsters and you never know what you what you will reveal. And then there will be different synergies all the time, offering you a different puzzle sure. all the time. So we thought having these three extra monster factions is a really nice addition to the game. And um, we also did not want to overdo it. We wanted to focus on a solid core game, mm -hmm. which I think we have, and then on this uh, last stand expansion with the three additional monster factions. But we, I think there are d plenty of more monster oh, factions yeah. someone could think of, but we did, as I said, we did not want to overdo it. We, are, we want to have a really good running game, and that's the yeah. way we, we presented it at the moment. And yeah, yeah I there's think, no, no point in diluting the, uh, the concept by trying to push additional bits in there that will just um yes just feel half baked whereas yeah. you've got a, a really interesting I, I really love how the the idea behind the the tower defense and the puzzle that you brought in like you were saying 
every night will be different for your nights because it's not just the monsters you'll be facing, but what's available in the market will be different. Mm -hmm. And there'll be nights where you're standing against a horde of oncoming orcs and undead and you're thinking, oh, if only I hadn't broken X, Y, or Z last night, um, I'd be in a much better position now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the final thing is it, it finishes on the 19th on Kickstarter. And if, Correct. if people get involved in the Kickstarter, there's a, an additional boss, which is the dragon. That will be a, a Kickstarter exclusive. Um, and I assume it's a particularly nasty character in itself. Yes, it's the the most fearsome boss in the game. Um, the dragon is basically coming on its own. It's not having any supportive monster monster types. It's just a different boss that you can use in your games, or you mm -hmm. can also randomize it and take it in and have four boss to choose from. And then the dragon itself um, has uh, its own tactic cards basically each boss has a different set of tactic cards that can be um, triggered during each of the night phases mm -hmm. and as i explained the other monsters uh, bosses they they will do lane damage depending on a specific monster type the dragon will not he will just do other things with his tactic cards that will cause lane damage or other yeah not so not so nice things to in, your village in, in or indiscriminate the burning. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> setting fire to everything. Uh, please tell me it's Trogdor. Uh, we, we can, but hope. <laughs> uh, well, it's it sounds like a fascinating game, Andre. Uh, it's already funded on Thank Kickstarter, you. so if if people are keen on getting involved in telling their own night tales, um, definitely it's one to look at. It's one to jump on board with. I I absolutely adore it. It's it sounds like a, a really fun game for a variety of whether you want to just hammer through for yourself mm -hmm. in an evening or if you want to get the friends around and compete to see who the best knight is and try and keep the uh the new king alive mm -hmm. uh throughout the dark long hours uh then i think definitely knight's tales is one to look out for yeah definitely well uh andre thank you very much for joining us everybody get your comments in below we'll move on we'll see you again soon even more news bitches and of course, whenever you think Ben has given it to you, he comes back and he gives you more. Ben, <laughs> hit us with more news. Okay, yeah, so uh, we're going to be diving into some stuff that was revealed at Gamma this week as well for Games Workshop and the future of what's happening in the worlds of Age of Sigma and in 140,000 as well in a little bit of time. Uh, but first off, we're diving into the Mortal Realms and we're looking at some new stuff that was revealed for that. And that was that we're going to be seeing a new warband coming to Warhammer Underworlds, and that is Morgwraith's Blade Coven. So if you have always liked the idea of picking up the uh, Daughters of Cain as a faction in the world of Age of Sigmar, now you have the chance to do so as part of Warhammer Underworlds. Uh, I will say, one of the cool things I like about Warhammer Underworlds as a whole, just as sort of like a concept, is that it's a really fascinating way for you to dive into the world of Age of Sigma and kind of get a snapshot of each of the different factions before sort of died, deciding to, you know, dive in and pick up a larger army or something like that. I've really loved a lot of the different warbands they've done. We talked about it a lot on the show, and hopefully I'll put a link down below so you can go and see some of the other ones and stuff that we featured before. But I really like a whole bunch of the sculpting that they do for these. I think they're really awesome, very narrative and very cinematic. They add loads of different character into the mix, and they really give you a taste of what you're getting coming forward. And I think Morgrave's Blade Coven looks is particularly awesome. I even liked... And I'm sure some people will be, you know, marmited by this. But the character in the bottom right-hand corner just reminds me of those characters you've got in the old sort of Hero Quest, Warhammer Quest boxes. The ones are in that. Yes, that's I not have the my one. And I'm ready to fight. That's <laughs> not the one sporting the red bra. Then no, no bottom right. <laughs> other, your, your other bottom right. right. The double. Right. Yeah, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. I like that character, but I'm I'm looking at the red bra character. Yeah. And I'm like, ah. Huh? I don't get it. You know, uh, it's, it's like Workshop are doing this a lot more, trying to put in like ridiculously dynamic poses. I mean, like I, oh, yeah. I had a look at Jan Zar for forty k. It's this nothing week. to do with the pose. In it's it. the bra. Make okay. it bigger. Oh, Alan Biggin, Alan Biggin. <laughs> it's the, the bra. It's ridiculous. I'm, I'm looking at it. Look, I, I, I have no issue with uh, sculptors hitting the female form and doing all sorts of things, but I'm looking at it and I don't get it. I just don't get it. That's just it's just weird. It's just, it's just really weird. It, bit, it looks a bit like the Hobgoblin. Yeah, the mask. Yeah, in a bra. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, you know, it's, um, I, I wonder is it one of them uh, bras with the chicken fillet things in it? You know, it's like... <laughs> 
Well, uh, I don't know. You know, yeah. it, it, here, that gives us something to comment about this week. Let's yeah. talk about the bra. Uh, so, so as, as well as the blade cover that, uh, yes, for Warhammer and that kind of thing, they also showed off a preview of what's coming in for the large new army for the Forces of Order, and that is the Lumineth Room Lords, which is Realm Lords, sorry, which is a long way of saying High Elves. Yes. In, uh, uh, the it's a copyrightable signal. way of saying high exactly. elves, Ben. Yes. So. Of course. Yes. Got to hit those those important notes. Yes. Uh, so leading the way, we got to look at the Aurelian Sentinels, which is their new take on archers. Uh, so you've got those uh, units there. So you've got that sort of set of regimented archers with their bows all to the skies, ready to fire their arrows followed by one of their leaders as well, which is pretty cool. And then there's also the Alarith Stone Mage, uh, which is one of the magic users of this force. And as you might have imagined, when it comes to um, high elves, high elves in the world of Age of Sigmar, you know, with Teclis at the head of them as a god, they're all going to be very adept wizards and mages and sorcerers. And so that's where we get this kind of like Zen style look to the models here. Um, I know a lot of people are sort of like in two minds as to the kind of aesthetic of the Lumineth Realm Lords at the moment. I kind of quite like it. I think it looks kind of cool. I like the sort of mix between the different aesthetics from sort of like China and the Far East, Mongolia, a little bit of the Middle East in there as well. You've got kind of like Persian influences and that kind of thing. I really like what they're doing there and trying to draw on kind of the images that we used to get of sort of Cathay from uh, Warhammer Fantasy uh, Battles back in the day as well in some of the sort of artwork for the role play books too. I, I think they look kind of interesting. I, I think some of their other units are a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more interesting than these ones. Uh, but you know, if you're going to have a set of regimented archers, then I think that kind of fits the bill. Um, one cool little thing that I didn't realize until I read one of the design articles as well is that all of the, if you look at all the tassels and all the sort of banner poles and everything, mm -hmm. they're all flowing exactly the same way if you sort of line them up or look in the right direction. And that's a, a decision they've made specifically to kind of show the kind of unity within the force, which I didn't really realize. Until you like look at the, some of the other characters like Teclis and, and some of the other sort of characters they've been working on in the past. So as well, basically, like the they've realised that the wind blows in one direction. Well, yeah, yes, and it yeah. doesn't blow your hair up. Yeah. Here, have you noticed? Bring up the bows again. Yes, I, again, I've, I've got something up. I want to say about have the bows. Have you noticed the way they're strung with three strings? Oh, yeah, yes. that's weird. And yes. it's not often you get bows with actually strong. No, that's an important well, strong and with the arrow on. Yeah, them. no, yeah. but that's an important point because uh, previously they wouldn't have strung bows because uh, it would have broken off. And yeah. now they've given us three to break off. Yeah, well, so if, it's, it's, <laughs> if you look even closer at this, yes. the bows are actually designed kind of like a leaf spring. Like a what spring? A leaf spring off a car. Um, explain to it me, means Justin. To look, uh, look at the top part of the bowed bit. The, yeah. la right. the layered aspect. It's like a suspension it. of a car where they'd put yeah. two or three springs together. So you oh, you mean the, it's a composite uh, bow then, is what you're saying? Yes, that's what yes, you're saying. It's a composite bow. Okay. Uh, it's not a leaf spring. It looks like a leaf spring. <laughs> I like them. But then I'm a big fan of the High Elves as the High Elves, I've got to say. See, so. I think it's this faction that had one of the most interesting reveals uh, a while back on the Warhammer community page, which yeah. was... Was it a good model? It was a model I liked. <laughs> it was a model that I personally liked. And so what keep was your tongue that? behind your teeth. Yes. Uh, basically, keep your what behind tongue your... behind your teeth. Keep your tongue behind your teeth. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Right, it was basically an armoured warrior with no warrior inside, so it was empty yeah. armour. Oh, right. Was, built in, was, uh, did, in position to did, fight. Did somebody buy a 2004 catalogue from Rackham then? <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen that miniature. Have you not? Well, look. Clearly somebody at Games Workshop has then and went, well, Welcome to Grognard Network. Because <laughs> <laughs> they did that a very long time ago. Well, it was one I saw and I really liked. Uh, the modeling, the modeling question was, I think it's the sort of reborn version of Eltharion, if you remember him from the um, sort of fluff in the background of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. But he's been sort of brought back as this kind of ghostly light version of, uh, of, a, of a high elf by Teclis. I, I did actually quite like um, a comment that was on a, a Reddit thread about this, and it was like, you can bring back all of these elves, but you cannot give me back my body, Teclis, you <laughs> asshole kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> right. We also had some Necromunda teasers and the, re the return of the ever-larger, ever-growing uh, Gasgo. Yeah, so we'll get to those two uh, big badasses in a second and we'll look at the stuff from Necromunda first. Um, so one of the big previews this week was the next book So uh, for Necromunda. Uh, we've seen House of Change, which is the, effectively, I guess you'd say, the codex for the House Goliath. 
Uh, now we're seeing House of Blades, which is the uh, new codex for the House Escher. Um, so both of the, the factions from the original box are now being given their sort of upgrade bu uh, books here. They will contain rules and scenarios and all kinds of bits and pieces for you to upgrade your gangs and use them in different ways. And some of the model previews we saw for this are, were the Death Maidens. So these are House Escher gangers who have died and been brought back through the use of foul sciences, which I think are very cool. And then you've also got the Wild Runners, who are effectively, think of them look sort of like a little bit like Jews, I guess you'd say, for the House Escher now. Uh, and they come with some very awesome looking sci-fi bows. I think they look absolutely amazing. And they are also flanked by the, and I cannot quite pronounce this, I'm going to say Spellings? spellings and they're kind of like little weird reptile cat creatures that they uh, the house actually used to hunt down people down in the sort of underhive as well as I say, really like the look of all these. I think the aesthetic for House Escher is really awesome. And I think if there were going to be, if there was going to be a house within Necromita that I'd go and pick up, it would probably be House Escher, because I love the idea of painting up some of these sort of bolder colours and things like that across the, the model range. Um, as well as the stuff for Necromunda, we also got to see some more previews as well. So there was the announcement that there's going to be a new book and some new models for Adeptus Titanicus. So that's still grinding forward, Engine nice. Kill. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've got uh, the Knight Asheron and the Knight castigator there as part of the book for the defense of riser and then finishing things off was a little bit of a teaser for what's coming for the next psychic awakening book and that is that the one and only fabius vile is returning with his entourage of weird scientists to go and warp the space marine gene seed especially now that the primaris has had the rubicon primaris exists and he's pushing people through that so that's an interesting one coming up for chaos fans as well I, I think you'll find he's trying to improve it. <laughs> we also got yeah. Ragnar Blackmane yeah. and the the new Gasgol. Uh, two fine looking models, I've got to say. Yeah. Gasgol looks absolutely ridiculous. Look at this. It's enormous, isn't it? Mm. But I love the way they've actually done the full resculpt on his face because the older orcs are really starting to look cartoony, like your original boys set. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. they really need to update it to like this level for the entire orc range. Well, it's got to be happening soon. Mm. You know, Gazgol is bound to be yeah. the the, 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 the first, lead up to this. The first oh. primary orc. Yes. Released. <laughs> so all of the other orcs will now be primary orc as well. <laughs> get just well, I mean, like you do have. Primaris sized orcs. Well, yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. Yeah, Vulcan fought one. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I think he fought the same one a few times. Right. Okay. Uh, read the Saga of the Beast from Black Library. Mm -hmm. Can't make me. <laughs> and uh, bring up Black Mane there to we get a look at him. Uh -huh. so. Primaris orcs, will we just call them porks? Yeah, that works. <laughs> yeah, porks. Yeah. Porks is good. Pig orcs were a thing back in the day. They can, beat, they can do it yeah. again. That's so. true. <sighs> right That's there. a lovely sculpt. Nicely done. Yeah. I'm not. A huge fan of the sculpt, partly because he's standing on a thing again, and no hero can step on the floor anymore. They're all these yeah, things yeah, rather. Yeah. But it's very. I know they've tried to make it dynamic, but it's still very samey. And he's got one arm forward and one arm back, swinging his weapon. Mm -hmm. He's had those stumpy claws forever and a day. He could have had one foot up as if he's kicking something and had those extended. Oh, do they extend? Do yeah, they? They could, yeah. For, for the stabbing into people's faces, he could have had you know a bit more of an interesting pose than one arm up, one sword up, which yeah. is well, which is their default. Every character has got one hand in the air and one weapon in the yeah. air. Yeah, and I just felt they could have done more with him, made him a bit more dynamic instead of just going. Ah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of seeing what you're saying because they're they're trying to catch motion with every single character now, and they do uh, it. By, it's, get, it's getting a little boring. They do it by putting both hands in the air. And so you're saying the there's so much motion that it's boring. I'm saying there's not enough there's, motion in it. It's they're, the they're, same they're, type of motion. It's we used to call it the big book of Citadel static poses. So yeah, you could just go through and go left arm up. So you're getting motion right sickness. Up, both arms raised. Yes, huh? <laughs> I, I will. I will say yes. If, what, if what they'd had him set. So you had Gasgill there, and if you had him in a position where either he had both hands on the axe and maybe one foot as if kicking forward, or yeah. just give him more but of a dynamic He does have a foot story. up on something. Yeah, they, yeah, but I don't care about him. I'm talking about the Space Wolf. Yes. As if he was fighting Ragnar rather than Ragnar going, aha, Jedi mind trick. Yeah. Actually have him sticking the boot in yeah. or yeah. just doing something a little bit more interesting than I'm going to be leaping off a rock. Because, because the model itself, like the face new. is incredible. Yeah, mm. but everybody you know, leaps so. off a rock these days. Mm -hmm. 
It would be interesting to, to see. I suppose you're somewhat limited, right? Because a Space Marine's armor does limit somewhat in, in yeah. how you pose it to actually uh, make it work. And but, if you don't jump off a rock, you'll just look like the superheroes from the Marvel movies before the CG's been done. That is true. <laughs> woeful. Woeful. But, well then, have, have him on a rock, mm. kicking somebody then. But they they all look like they're skipping. Yes. Because they all get to the point where they, they, they're they going to do their wee jump, and they go for it, and that's all you see. And it looks woeful until they CGI it. And then it looks amazing. And then it looks uh, amazing. And have you not seen Chris Evans doing his like twirling backflip jump thing? No. Okay, look it up after the show. It's actually kind of awesome. Right. <laughs> there we go. These guys are... <laughs> Right. We just search weird and, stuff on and, YouTube. It was why they took TFI Friday off the air. <laughs> oh, yeah. I told Warren about that one. That's your lot for the news. Um, uh, one of you guys got a chance to have... It was John, wasn't it? Yes, got a chance to have a sit-down yeah. with Chris from Battlefront to bring us an update on um, the British Paris mid-war book and a mm. couple of bits. So let's see how they got on. Hello everyone, myself and Chris are back again. Um, ignore the background because it's not late war British we're going to be talking about not here. Not quite, no. no. Um, but you thought this would be a good opportunity at least to talk a bit more about some British stuff that's coming. Absolutely, so this is real, uh, real sneak peek tease ahead of what's <laughs> coming. So yeah, we're going to talk about Red Devils. Uh, mm -hmm. Red Devils obviously the name given to the paratroops by the, the Germans because of their maroon berets. Yep. Um, and Red Devils is a mid-war British airborne and commando book. Yep. So we're stepping back a little bit in the war. So 1942 to 43. Yep. Um, a lot of Red Devils is based around Sicily and Italy itself. Yeah. And what you'll find, especially with um, a lot of the background, it talks about North Africa with a Tunisian sort of campaign. Then it goes into Sicily and landing in Italy. And what it is basically showing you is an Eighth Army force that uses paratroopers and commandos yeah so this is an add-on if you like to armored fist which was the mid-war british book that came out a couple of years ago now mm -hmm. but it's still obviously playable yeah um and what this does is allows people to use the plastic infantry mm -hmm. and the plastic airborne that we're bringing out for late war yeah but take it back a couple of years so you've got almost a two for one army yeah yeah um and this is a standalone book it's only a small booklet it's not hardback like the rest of our yeah. books that comes with um a pack of unit cards mm -hmm. for everybody that you need and also its own dedicated pack of command cards yeah so you've got your parachute company mm -hmm. which as we know is in the d-day british book yeah uh the only difference with this really is it's pointed slightly more towards uh mid-war yeah and gets a few options that weren't available in late war such as boys and tank rifles things like that yeah um the equipment that's a little bit more should we say Deadly in mid-war is a lot more expensive, things like piots, but they're also less available. Yeah. So when you're putting your force organisation chart together and what they can have, the anti-tank element isn't quite there. So mid-war, you haven't got 17-pounders as readily accessible. Yeah. So this unit only has six-pounders, but then on the force organisation diagram, you definitely get um, machine guns and mortars as well, but not both. One yeah. or the other, you see. One or the other. Yeah. <laughs> um, you've also got in here your commando troop so the commandos or the um the number three commandos i think it was of the army and then you had the 1441 of the marines yeah were around they were doing what they were meant to be doing which is obviously assaults and getting in there closing the objective down things like that and within the book it's got a little bit of background around the norwegian campaigns they did a lot of um, did, yeah. bits and bobs around that um and it was sort of after dunkirk really that they were formed and in here you get the options of obviously the mortars you've got your um obviously medium machine gun groups as well um as well as support units so it's not just a case of having two formations you've got you know a little bit of uh, support units that are for whichever side really mainly obviously air landing for these two yeah as ever you've got the painting guide so you know you've got your nice uh, denison smocks for this one again mm -hmm. with um, some nice close-ups as well and if you look at the book this is actually 100% actual size, yeah. but it shows how you can paint Denison smocks easily. <laughs> and then the final bit of the book, which is really important, is the product list that you can use from the new range that's coming out, mm -hmm. plus a couple of the special order items direct from our mail order website and Flame to War um, that you can get and use for your mid-war that isn't available for late war, so aren't in them, them box sets. Yeah. So it's just a nice little book. It adds very well onto the uh, All-American and the Death From Above mid-war 
uh, airborne boxed for Germans and Americans. It's a lot of words, isn't it, on that yeah, one? There's but, a, <laughs> the, 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 yeah, but it's the Germans and the Americans, the Fallschirmjäger and the airborne that they had for mid-war that we produced as a, yeah. a standalone box. And again, like I said, you've got unit cards, you've got command cards. It all comes into a nice snazzy cardboard holder. So when yeah. you buy it, you just whip them out and uh, good to go. So I thought I'd just share that with you and yeah. uh, get you all excited about Airborne as well. <laughs> yeah, because um, in that mid-war period, you, that's where we start to see, I mean, beyond what the Germans did before that, where they used some air landing during their, their Blitzkrieg campaigns, yeah. um, it's where you start to see the, the seed of what becomes the Allied's um, Operation Overlord yeah. stuff. That's where they start to learn Absolutely. because they've they've looked at the Germans' early war success and went, "This this is going somewhere. This is something we should be utilizing." Uh -huh. And of course, the Americans went wholeheartedly with that. Yeah. Got the eighty second set up, got the hundred and first going, and then obviously deployed the eighty second into um, Sicily. I think was their first drop, or was it, it Italy? Was... No, I think Sicily was first because it was Operation Husky. Yep. Correct us if we're wrong, obviously, in the comments, but I definitely know that Sicily was kind of the backbone and they dropped them into the mountains because nobody yeah. thought that they could go there. But you had the Falschimiega and obviously the um, the Italian, uh, the name escapes me, for, for the, the Italian air paratroopers. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's just completely gone. But yeah, they were sort of set up more around the coastline to defend against an airborne, yep. uh, sorry, a seaborne assault when the airborne came in in the mountains. And yep. they proved the worth, you know. There's pictures that I've seen of units that were actually affiliated on the beret cap badges to the Army Air Corps mm -hmm. that in theatre got given the um, sort of the mould, shall we say, for the airborne parachute. Yeah. And they were literally making them out of spent shell casings, whatever <laughs> they could melt down over a fire and compressing it in this mould and then going, I've got a cap badge and popping it in. So you see pictures of them using this cap badge with yeah. blue berets, black berets, every other colour apart from maroon when it came in very sort of late into 1942 going to 43 and then suddenly they had an identity yeah um and obviously that's why now the paratroopers are still part of the regular army in terms mm -hmm. of their force organization but they are quite rightly specialist troops you yeah know? and they've they've gone on and done some incredible operations throughout world war ii and, uh, and beyond as well uh, yeah absolutely i mean british troops are still jumping uh, as far as uh, was it operation varsity into the rhineland and things like that yeah you know they were jumping towards the end of the war and several units got several jump badges on their uh, yep. uh, on their uniforms kind of thing and even as far as the commandos that are in this book as well you know, the commandos were originally part of the army, but then the Royal Marines had their own separate uh, yeah. special service for, for them units, and you can use them all in there, in the book. So it's just really nice little thing that you can use in addition to your D-Day German, D-Day British, D-Day American, whatever flavor you've got. Yeah. These books are the extra bit for that. Yeah, absolutely. So interesting, because I've seen the supplements coming out, and I've been like, oh, I see they're doing a lot of the mid-war airborne, and... I was questioning it for a bit, and then I realised, no, hang on, this is where a lot of the airborne forces cut their teeth, so to speak. Yeah. And where there's two, there's two pivotal points. There's where the Allies learn the value of airborne, and the Germans get scared of using airborne. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's when the when the Fallschirmjäger jumped into Sicily or whatever it was and got yes. a really bad time for them yeah. and heavy losses. But of course, the Allies had the the more man part, and they were more willing rather callously in some cases, mm -hmm. to say, well, we can accept 50% casualties if they can still be motivated achieve enough our, yeah, to do their objective. And achieve their objective. I mean, yeah. even Crete as well taught the Germans that the value of actually keeping your troops on the ground, because the British on the ground took out so many Fallschirmjäger yep. units dropping around the uh, main sort of airfields and yep. things. And it was Crete I meant when, when Germany hit the, those heavy losses. Yeah. That, that, that was the point they got scared of it. Yeah, but they still won the battle because the British then had to withdraw again. So yep. they'd already got out of Greece, and then they had to jump to Crete, and then they have to come out again and, and go to Malta, I think they got evacuated to. Yep. Um, it, it does show that even though Germany turned around and, with the airborne cause and went, we don't want you to jump into combat anymore, mm. but what we do have now is a core of very heavily, very highly motivated troops. Yeah. And they were put into excellent use in Normandy. Absolutely, As, as yeah. tank hunter groups and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. They, used, they knew how to use their camouflage. They knew how to use their mobility mm -hmm. very well. Yeah, yeah. And um, they regardless of not jumping out of airplanes anymore, even with paratroopers today, they're not jumping out of airplanes as much anymore, but every time they're utilised, they do prove their worth every time. Absolutely, because they're highly trained for that specific reason as well, you know. I was referring back to the, um, in Band of Brothers when Dick Winters says, 
Well, but if you go that way, you'll be surrounded. It's like we're paratroopers. We're, paratroopers. we're meant to be surrounded. We're meant to be surrounded. Yeah. It's that that motivation, that that level of thought is exactly mm. how paratroopers have done so well in every conflict they've been involved in. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think it was um were they in the fault they were in the Falklands. Well. They were in the Falklands, they yeah. Were. They were one yeah. of the first troops to hit them and the commandos, ironically, yeah. Yeah. So obviously they went in and I think Goose Green was um very heavily paratroopers charging up the hills and yep. and getting across the, uh, the the open ground to the enemy, taking again horrendous losses, but achieving the objectives. Yeah, and doing it all the while flying the flag and like <laughs> yeah, and you, you see the picture in Maroon Berets. Yeah, you know, and they they you know as as annoyed as they probably were having to do what they did <laughs> yeah. in the Falklands, they probably walked out of that thinking they'd done a really good job and they which did, they did. So. Yeah, quite rightly, absolutely. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, we digress again. <laughs> we digress. Of course we digress. Why wouldn't we digress? Next week, guys, we have uh, a bunch of other Flames of War stuff coming out. We do indeed. Uh, John and Chris sat down and take a deep dive through the uh, British book for D-Day, Late uh -huh. War, um, going through some of the formations. They also There's a video coming out on some of the new releases to expect because they've changed over a lot of stuff from resin and metal into delightful hard plastic mm -hmm. so they'll be taking a look at some of the new kits and the command cards as well so over the next week we're going to have several videos coming out if hard you're you. if you're into your flames of war um definitely uh, stay tuned mm -hmm. right he gets the challenge every week he rises to the challenge like a shroom easy on a broom. Easy tiger, easy. <laughs> ben, okay, yeah. amaze us, man. <laughs> what did you pick for this week's Kickstarters? Uh, so first up, we've got the HD Basis Kickstarter. Yes! I was hoping so, you'd do this one. Yeah, so this is a set of uh, pre-coloured and ready-to-go bases. Mm -hmm. And even though it may look like it, these are not stickers just on top of bases. No, they're not. That would be silly. These are made using a very fancy UV-based technique for 3D printing, which I'm sure you guys wow. will go into in a little bit more detail. But they allow you to create, well, them to create full color designs on their bases, which have layers and intricate um, sort of bits and pieces in them as well. So while it may look a little bit flat, they actually are, you know, you know, fully yeah, designed. to are fully like textured. UV-lits to it and all that kind of thing as well. And, uh, yeah, as I say, they are ready and, you know, raring to go with whatever armor you have, just sticking it straight onto the bases, and they're good to go. Uh, they've done them in a whole bunch of different um, styles and designs and sizes. Um, so regardless of what kind of armor you're building up, there are a whole bunch of different ways for you to go and go on this. So if you like sci-fi, fantasy, historical, or anything like that, there are a whole bunch of different ways for you to go in and, uh, and pledge for whatever you like in this new fangled style that they've done these bases in. So yeah, very cool. I love this. I've been watching uh, Justin and the team at Secret Weapon been building up to this for mm. a while. And I, I just got to say, like, I, as soon as I first saw it, I thought to myself, oh, boy, if you have nailed this, that, that, that is stonkingly cool. So um, it, what, it, what it is, so you have your black, your black base blank. Mm -hmm. You <laughs> then have um, a 3D... Um, textured insert okay so it is actually properly 3d mm -hmm. um, yep. uh, with all of its raised and lower parts that 3d part is then uh, printed um, uh, with a UV printing technology or something like that bring that picture up did I talk about this years ago Print. oh yeah you you invented it Justin <laughs> well, I remember we were talking about on a backstage episode about the advancements of 3D printing, and I asked, was there some form of way where UV technology could be used to actually force color changes, a chemical color change? Uh, well, no, it doesn't do that. Okay. Was this uh, in your, <laughs> mystic, was this your Mystic Mug days? Was yes, it? this no, is no, what no, this no. was. Yeah, this is this mystic is when Mug more like this is when me and Justin uh, were predicting that uh, space marines would have uh, little mechanical devices in them, so they look like they're breathing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on the table I top. guarantee you someone's eventually going to Blinky, that. community member Blinky, there's one for you. Um, <laughs> we want little breathing space marines. So, so tiny little actuators. <sighs> like that. Right. Panting space marines. Quick question. If you had to pick one of these, which one's your favourite? Oh. I'm putting you on the spot, I know, but... No, you're not. No, you're not, because I, I have long picked my favourite. Uh-huh. Okay. In one! <laughs> it's, 
Uh, I love the one with the, is that the fleur de lis you would call it? So that's the silent halls. Yes, I I love the silent halls. Mm. Into! (laughs) It's got to be the mosaic burst. Very Lahambra Palace. Oh, I love it. And the reason I love the mosaic burst is because you could never do that. Yeah. I could never paint that. Um, It it just, that would be an army that uh, I would never, I would never see. Mm -hmm. Now, what army I would put on it? I don't know. Zulus? I was, well, <laughs> I was going, to say, going to say the new Afghan warriors when they come out <gasps> with spike ring bits. Well, mm-hmm. no, uh, and, just, and then just put some sand over it to dirty them up. Yes. yes. Do it proper kind of Alhambra. 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 Style. That would be amazing. Uh, I'm not finished yet. Go back, Justin. Well. Oh, okay, okay. Sure. I'm, giving you my, I'm giving you my top ten. <laughs> There's not ten there. <laughs> well, you're gonna get you're gonna get it anyway. In three, Town Square. I think Town Square <laughs> is is awesomely cool. If you use that for some fantasy humans, definitely some. Oh yeah, uh, you stuff, could use that awesome. for fantasy humans. You know, that, that would do, take you up right into your um, Victorian stuff. Mm. And... What's that new game coming out from those people? Uh, it's a terrible computer game. You like it? What Skyrim. One? Skyrim. Oh, yeah. yeah, you mm-hmm. could have them on that, couldn't you? Yeah. yeah. See, that's got terrible humans in it. Computer game. <laughs> <laughs> and four. <laughs> it's got to be. Oh, it's getting tricky now. I think under factory. Mm. Perfect for your Necromunda. Yeah. Yep. Perfect for Necromunda. Perfect for pretty much anything. See that Aliens game that's coming out from uh, yeah, yeah. You could Gale do Force 9? Stick it on that. Then we have mats that match that pretty much perfectly in mm-hmm. here. We do, true. but the, the Necromunda board itself would match in pretty damn well with that too. Mm hmm. In nine. Um, oh, count, <laughs> count. I told you it was going to be a top ten. <laughs> uh, Dark Circuit would definitely mm. be my uh, in nine. I'm um, thinking Infinity LF on that or some Toha. Uh, and then in ten. Fractal Black gets my last vote because I don't know what it is. You don't well, get it. I don't get it. It, it looks like a laser light shoe. Go down, yeah. go down and, and see what the stretch goals are. I can't well. quite. A Tron. Um, yeah, I think we already went through the stretch goals. Yeah, so but I want to go up the way. But, but, but we, we've got something to say. I want to want to talk about stretch goals, right? Yeah. So, of the stretch goals, mm-hmm. Red Veil's beautiful, isn't it? Mm. Red Veil is Eugene. beautiful. In fact, that is oh. Eugene. Yeah, of course, it's their official Infinity bases. Are oh, they, right. What, the, they, the, is that made to match the the actual mats then as well? Because we have yep. mats that look just like the exactly. Ice well, if, yeah. Uh, if you think, yeah, that's for each of the the starter sets that they do, Lloyd. No. Also, the name matches. Yeah. Also, um, a little bird tells me that if uh, if they start unlocking stretch goals, mm. they may have teamed up with Cool Mini or not for zombie side bases as well. Yeah. Oh, very well, cool. You've got to check out types. the lava flow theme. Mm-hmm. Isn't that nice? That's cool. Although the urban streets is really cool. Yeah. Because I mean, like, if you think, how much of the the stuff do we have for foreground for like the the homeland apocalypse? Mm-hmm. Put your minis on that with like one of. If, you remember the big mall map we did? Yes. And all the suburbs and stuff. Those would be perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I'm going to be really boring here, but where, where, where's the cracked earth one? <laughs> Oh, they have a desert <laughs> one. Oh, do they? They do have a desert one. I've seen photographs of a desert one. Um, Probably not unlocked yet. Yeah. It's either maybe not unlocked, or is this their first run at this? Is this the first time they've done this, or do yes. they maybe already have a ring? No, no, they've never done this before. Okay. This is this is brand new technology, Justin, okay. based on your invention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's <laughs> Smart arse. Where are we now? Are they, are they funded, or what? Yes, they are oh, funded. Oh, they're funded. They are funded. It's Let me just now roll up the top here. Up to the community to band so together. So double funded. Yeah. So it's just up to the community now to get stuck in there and realize what this is for what it is. This is innovation mm-hmm. up there mm-hmm. and a m- perfect way mm-hmm. of fast basing some yeah. minis. Well, with you doing all your rebasing, I'm betting you want to give this a go to try and rebase an older army. I tell you what, if you are into collecting your pre paints, mm-hmm. Like the old Wizards of the Coast yes. Star Wars stuff, or the the pre painted D and D minis and things mm-hmm. like that. This is perfect for that. Mm-hmm. Absolutely perfect. No, just cut so, them off the the flat black bases. If you cut yeah, them you off, go. it's not necessarily the best idea to try and do that. Oh no, no, you clip. Just clip the base down until you have two big studs Platforms. sticking out the problem of the feet, and then just go. 
I just use my teeth. <laughs> I see. At that point, now, that's where I get it on its side and take a knife just along the, the sole of the boot. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. if you're going to rebase, don't just try to slice your mini off the base. Cut the base down until you have two stubs and then just go... Yeah, off so they end up with slightly weird half feet. I have seen test yeah. prints yeah. of a kind of like a grassy kind of area, something oh, similar to nice. the, the top oh, here. Some grassy knolls, that'd be uh, amazing. And I have seen, uh, I have seen a desert one. Mm. I am loving this because you, I have a, a, a difficulty painting these days of, a, of dodgy wrists and lazy mm -hmm. syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I take great pride in rebasing, mm -hmm. but it takes a while yeah. because I do awesome. Well, if you think, however, if, if you do a set and then have to come back and redo a set, you have to remember how to do it again. Whereas this, you just buy more of the same. That's he's, got, true. he's got a point. I've done that where I've painted up yeah. stuff and had it looking immaculate, left it a couple of months, done it up, followed my thing, and I went, I've bollocks this up somewhere. Doesn't look anything <laughs> like it. Even, so well, you will get consistent basing off this. This, this unlocks um, uh, one of my hobbies, which is finding. Um, fairly mundane looking painted stuff mm -hmm. on eBay um, and uh, this would allow me to get through it a bit quicker yeah. um, on the whole rebasing side. I have to wonder, are these designed to take two peas? Uh, no. no. Is that something you, you do like a lot? Yes, but what I will do mm. is I will quietly reach out to Justin and the gang mm -hmm. and I'll say, see them blanks? They're almost genius. But I have a genius idea for yeah, you. Man. Yeah, that 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 next level. Yeah, this will make your sales in the UK <laughs> go up five million percent. No, it won't, because nobody wants bases as big as you. Nobody I, wants the two P plus extra. I like the plus extra. You should be going one P plus extra. Not at all. So that way you get Not all the P all. goodness and weight, but none of the extra. Yes, but you get one P, I get two. Twice the P. <laughs> yeah, but Warren likes the extra girth, let's be honest here. It has to be had. I like to know when I've got a miniature in my hand. And if you add the 2P with the right polarization, Justin, you can almost feel it throb when you <laughs> hold it in front of your opponent. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, we all love heavy miniatures. They have presence on the table. I mean, like, I've mentioned it many, many times. Whenever privateers started switching to their plastic resin and then to their plastic, they started doing metal cast bases to put your miniatures on. Yes. So you would have that weight. Yes. But I have two Ps. Yes. So. Anyway, this is fantastic. The question is I no longer 2P or not 2P. I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> right. I could feel that one waving out towards me. Damn it. Dad jokes are us. Yes. Right. Uh, HD bases, 12 Bad days it. less. I don't often say this. But that is a must back. Mm. We need to unlock Justin's secret weapon. Let's Justin. have a quick look at that. We're not going to unlock him. So <laughs> we need to up. unlock Justin from secret weapons ability mm. to do this. Because this technology could change everything. Yeah. I love it. If only you could get another three sides onto those bases instead of just that single circle. <laughs> thing, they would be perfect. Oh, no. <laughs> He could do square bases, I'm, I'm sure. sure. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. But he would have to. He would have to become sad <laughs> to do it. See a town square one. Yes. It'd be nice if he did some without the grills and stuff as well. Go back up. Mm -hmm. there but you go. just put bears on them. Because I want them for like Romans and stuff as well. Ah, uh, but you could put Romans on bears on them. Yep, and then there'd be <laughs> Roman bear grills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. oh, we are on fire today, right? So, uh, Ben, I'm nearly ready to stop the show. I think that Kickstarter w was uh, was awesome. I don't know how it could be followed, but you're going to try, aren't you? I'm going to give it a go. Right. Okay, cool. okay. what's next? Uh, so, next up is from the guys at Studio Level, and this is the Petrol Yard, or I should probably shout it because Petrol Yard is in capital letters on the mm. Kickstarter page. Um, so, it's a range of Kickstarter-exclusive resin terrain by these guys that has all been hand-sculpted uh, for you to use in your post-apocalyptic games. So, uh, the actual sort of content itself contains the gas station, which is called the Petrol Yard, the warehouse, the offices, a set of barricades, and also some additional scattered terrain. 
All of the terrain that they've done will be produced, as I was saying, in resin, and it is available to be magnetized as well. So you can uh, you could magnetize the roofs and all different sections of it as well in order to try and create a really nice modular tabletop uh, for your games set in the post apocalypse. So maybe if you're playing something like Punk Apocalyptic, or if you've got some of the models from the Ramshackle, the Ramshackle range, these would be a really good fit to it, especially because of the slightly more comic and heroic look to a lot of the terrain that we're seeing here. Um, one of the things I talked about when I was you know looking at this terrain earlier in the week is that I think this is really cool because you get a nice wide range of terrain and because of the sort of modular nature of it you can sort of put it together on the tabletop in a whole bunch of different ways which will allow you to create a really interesting um, set of different sort of like, like wasteland tabletops with effectively just that one set so if you wanted to do something and then sort of play around with the, the way that you put down your scatter terrain in your barricades you could actually set up a whole bunch of different style scenarios and stuff just with that one set of terrain um, there are a bunch of different sort of pledge levels for you to go for uh, there's one which is called the rookie players which is just nice and easy you get a, you know a few different pieces of terrain and then you can go from there and there's one at the very other end of the scale called the Psycho Pledge, which comes with a whole bunch of different stuff for you to pick up and mess around with that allow you to create even more interesting and diverse battlefields at the same time. Uh, but yeah, looks really cool. All of it's done so you can play on the exterior or the interior of these buildings, thanks to the modular nature of the, uh, the roofs and that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, looks really good. And as I was saying, it's Kickstarter exclusive. So if you don't get it through this, uh, then unfortunately it will have passed you by. Uh, but yeah, very cool. I can't stuff. look at it without... It running through my head, and I don't know why. Balls <laughs> of steel! <laughs> why am I Duke Nukem him whenever uh, I'm looking at this? It has that feel. Oh, there's a company that does it, Duke Nukem as well. I love it. Thank you, the company. Is <clears throat> I can't remember. It will come to me. But yeah, I, this is I nice. really like it. I like mm. it because everything is so grimy, gritty, down and dirty, and yes. hand sculpted. And We have and, some samples yeah. in yeah. here. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a closer yeah. look. Have a bit yourself. And so much these days is all auto cadded and then 3D printed and all looks yes. so pristine, whereas this looks absolutely... It's proper old school, it's, isn't yeah, it? Oh yeah, it's been smashed a bit. I Perfect just, for uh, Dodge Dread. <clears throat> Dread, um, Fallout, um, Wasteland, Warfare. Yes. I'm going to have to break, go and hunt out my one of my old books for a post-apocalypse game. It's called This Is Not A Test. Yeah. Yeah, by Ash. Yeah, that would also be good, yeah. Mm. It's not Ash. Yeah, but even things like that. So that the auto repair Mad Max looking just bit of scatter tree and that comes with his little corner section. Yeah, and you can either have it as a little lumpy bit. Oh, what's the car battle one that so Osprey can, does? You can do that. Gaslands. 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 Uh, yes. You would have to it's play big, Gaslands. The scale too big. Bigger okay. scale. Bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you can also go. Well, I'm going to take that. I'm going to take my petrol yard. Oh. See what I did there? So you can slam it onto the side so it becomes a corner Lovely. piece. Lovely. And yeah. then the interior bit can just... Where can we get an interior in there? Let's there you go. out of the way. There's an interior. And I can throw that into my corner. Mm -hmm. um, nice. That's I really so do. I, I love this. I love the fact there are petrol pumps and stuff everywhere as well. Yeah. They really have lent into the petrol yard nature of the yeah. petrol yard. Um, because you've got these lovely things where this one's still rocking away and it can be magnetized on or they have big chunky um scattered pieces i suppose you would call them all i yeah. can every time i look at them though all i can see is crates of main lemonade here because that's from all. the monor man <laughs> from the main man you do realize they're still out and about i almost started putting in an order for them to start delivering to the office to deliver monor <laughs> yeah. you can get yourself your scotch well, there's an atm there's an uh, atm that's an endangered species there we should get a yep we well that, that's get a you digger. Tell us the future jcb that'll be gone mm -hmm. see i can just sit and look super close at these and just pick out all the tiny little details and you always see something yeah. If, you, yeah if you look inside the barrel there yeah. There's a little skull. A skull? There's a little skull. Nice. Did you not spot the spider on that, though? No? There's a spider on that? Oh, there's spiders on several of them. Big, giant, creepy <laughs> spiders. All right. Big, big, post apocalyptic, they'll have your face spiders. Uh, yeah, like freak style. I think it's probably because this is post apocalyptic wasteland in Australia. Yeah. Mm. And we've got, I love this. We've got the big main building here mm -hmm. with its magnetization points. Mm -hmm. Pop the wee lid on. Yeah. Just be careful. You get the the. Don't reverse the polarity. So no. Don't reverse it. And there's the. What do we call this? Canopy or what? Yes. What's this? Yeah. Petrol station canopy. And Petrol then yard. That bit goes under there. Yeah. So this bit slots into that, like so. Come on. Ta da! And then you pop that on. The weird thing was when I was looking at this, 
I'm going because they say that scaled 28 to 32. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it feels like it should be bigger and it does look chunky and big. And then you actually put a, a like a Walking Dead 28 mil figure beside it. Mm -hmm. And you're going, actually, no, probably a lot of the terrain we see on the tabletop is probably underscaled. Yes. I'm, I'm yeah. getting into the opinion where you know overscaled terrain isn't necessarily a bad thing because it looks more realistic. Yes. Especially when you start putting people beside them. Well, it's something I like to do. You know, even uh, on any of the terrain uh, that we do, or we three D print, I like to overscale the terrain slightly where where possible. You know, it's um, uh, I think it, the the impact of it always always works out better. Mm -hmm. Incredible stuff. You know, it's lovely to see uh, the the old school handcrafted kind of mm -hmm. look to these, isn't it? You know, it's um, it's it's, it's surprising how much I've missed it. it. It's it does have that. Somebody sat down and then just went, what bits and pieces can I use to make these? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to break out the balsa and I'm going to break out some, God knows what those are, probably 135th scale maybe. Mm -hmm. Jerry cans from something like Verlinden. Or... But anyway, yeah, they've, they've spent time and effort laying down bricks upon bricks and probably at some point smashing with a hammer this Land Rover. Yeah. Is that not a Humvee? I have no idea what it is. But well, whatever it's, it is, it's, it's a been, Humvee. Whatever it is, it's been crumpled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it has uh, felt very, the might of a sledgehammer. I very much appreciate that. Yeah, I don't think it is a Humvee. Right, it's I think. A, it, I was just going to say, it's, one, it's like one of those things that we saw back when Tabletop Troubadour did their stuff. Um, you know, the guy from yeah, Johnny yeah, Allen, yeah. and yeah. he did his stuff with it, which was really characterful and interesting and all hand sculpted. We're seeing something similar with this in yeah. a very different style, which I think is really cool. So, yeah. no, it, look, I approve. Beautiful, mm. definitely, definitely. Okay, funded? Ben, I'll grant you that is a great Kickstarter. Are we funded? This one isn't. This is, is a couple hundred it's nearly dollars funded. short. Nearly funded. Yes, well, it, uh, the, let me scroll up. It's probably nearly the there four days left guys um it, if you're into your old school stuff definitely go and check yeah, that it's out just shy of funding at the so, minute getting there getting there yeah definitely right. want to dive in on though thank you for that ben appreciate that right justin yep it's time for you to join me for a little bit of the 3d print Three D printing is the shit, Justin. It is. We have an interesting one. Yes. So we are going to crowdsource your expertise. Yes. Hive we, mind. Yes. This is all. Uh, this uh, this is something we're going to do from time to time, just to 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 see how our collective awesomeness mm. comes together. Right. We are giving away this model. Yeah. This week, female for you guys to print at home. We're going to come back to that because we've got something nice and special for you guys on that. But in the meantime, oh, there's another thing I want to uh, I want to run past you. the the same uh, The same guys, Hero Spawn Spot, mm -hmm. have this incredible looking wyvern. Okay, so we have uh, printed the wyvern um, in a couple uh, of different ways. So this one was printed on our FDM printer as was this. Now it's going to be very white for you to see. Yeah, you'll see better from here. Let's show you the Cura settings for it. Yeah. So uh, very quickly, I'll scroll to the top. Mm -hmm. So our initial quality. 0 0.12. Yeah, fun. 0 0.12. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, and then from there, uh, we basically decided what we wanted to do with it. So something I've started doing with my 3D prints, which I think everybody should be doing, I'm increasing the wall thickness ever so slightly. Yes. Because it gives you a far stronger finished piece. Mm -hmm. So for these, they went to a 1.5 mil, so mil and a half sort yeah. of uh, wall thickness. Yes. Uh, then after that, uh, we went for the infill. Now, you specifically asked me to up the infill on this yes. one. Yes. Yeah, so we went for 30% on that. Mm -hmm. Now, that just means the, the internal structure is tighter more filled yes so again adding strength because if this is something you're going to be handling playing about with a lot you want it to be a little stronger yeah then after the infill we went to the material the material we use as a, a standard any cubic pla mm -hmm. and we always find so this stuff will start melting and being pliable at 190 degrees we always run it at 200 degrees because it just lets it flow that little bit better now one of the end results of that though is we did get a little bit of stringing we uh, did. from that so just be wary 
of your uh, temperatures and the speed of your prints mm. um, to try and get rid of that. We weren't too bothered with the stringing, to be honest, because um, it comes away very easily. So it's not a it's not a big deal. Yeah, that and if you have any little bits of leftover, you see if you take a heat gun and just pass it over the top of it, mm -hmm. because the filament's so fine on the stringing, it'll take the heat a lot quicker. And so yeah. it just curls in on itself out of the way. Basically disappears, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that can help with that is there's a setting in here called your Z-Hop Retract. Mm -hmm. So whenever it comes to the end of drawing out, say it was tracing around my hand, and it comes to the end of it, and then it's going up a layer. So whenever it's going away, it'll lift up a little and then pull away. Yes. So that just, it sort of like wipes itself. Mm -hmm. So it <laughs> wipes itself. <laughs> uh, other than that, uh, speed-wise, we went for 40, mm -hmm. so basically it's, it's not super quick, not super slow, but I didn't want this taking like three, four days. I think yeah. this took about... 12 hours. About 12 hours-ish. Yeah. Uh, it did that, take 12 hours because I looked. <laughs> so. All right, travel and cooling we don't really bother with. Yeah. Here's the important one for now, this type of this, miniature. Yeah, this is where we're going to start picking your brain. Mm. Because one of the most difficult things to get right on an FDM printer that we have found is supports. Mm. Now, a lot of what we print, we print from the likes of printable scenery, where it doesn't need supports. They 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 create the models uh, to basically just print as they are. Yeah, they stand with, on their own. With very little requirement for supports. Mm. However, when you start to get into printing minis, okay, mm. then you are going to need supports. Mm. Now, Justin, what supports did you go for on this one? All right, so the, the first thing, you tell it to put supports on, and then you have the option of putting supports everywhere or just where it's touching the build plate. Yeah. And here's one of the cool settings. So if we look in beneath here, you see everything that it's showing red here. Mm -hmm. That's where this is gonna try and place some supports. Right. Now, we can actually change the angle on this. So if I go to 90, you see all that red disappears. Yes. I went for 60, because uh -huh. I thought, you know, that's catching all the sort of flatter areas and stuff. Yeah. And building up around it, I think works pretty well. The type of, uh, scaffold I went for was concentric. You have a few options here. I like concentric because it's basically drawing circles uh -huh. around, well, not exactly circles, but it's just drawing a, a circle and a circle and a circle getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. And that I was thinking I can get a pair of pliers at that, rip it off. Mm, but yes, it's not so easy. No. What we find, and we have found this with almost everything that we've ever printed on the FDM, is that actually removing Removing the, the actual um, support structure is really, really difficult. Yeah, it's and, something I've noticed is it actually, whenever it gets to the top of it, it's printing out like a final flat layer yeah. that it then builds the rest on. Let me show you where it gets really messy. So the model looks not too bad at that. Yeah. Um, we have a few wee gaps and stuff that we would probably fill using a little bit of green stuff. Mm -hmm. Where do you see where it gets hard? This yeah. is all support structure that we were unable to remove. Yeah. It, it just is a real pain in the arse to try and remove all of that um, leftover support structure. Now, so, I have been having a look at this, and there yeah. is a setting in here. So if I select my concentric again, mm -hmm. so where is it? So you've got your support density on there, so you yep. can increase and decrease how much support it's actually building. Mm -hmm. Less is maybe better on this, because we had it set to 35. Yeah. Uh, however, support uh, Z distance is yeah. point, uh, 0 0.1, right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking I need to maybe increase that because maybe it'll bring that final layer a little further away. Possibly. And then it'll maybe not merge the way it's going. I yeah. haven't tested this just yet. That'll be for the next time I run one through. Well, uh, this is why we're punting it over to you guys. How have you guys been uh, setting your support structures whenever printing minis um, on FDM printers? There's got to be a better way because let me show you the difference, right? So, you know, I'm actually really rather pleased with the, the end print result mm -hmm. um, of this model. So if the support structure had have been uh, lessened and easier to remove, I think as an FDM model, this, this is actually really pretty mm -hmm. damn good. However, now, let me show you the resin print. Before you do that, there's one last thing I want to show everybody. So yeah. You see, after you've sliced your file, there's something you can do, which is actually throw it back into Cura. Yes. And from there, it starts to show you all of that scaffolding. Mm -hmm. And you can start actually pulling it down through and seeing if there's anywhere missed or weird. And you're actually able to just see that a little bit better. Yeah, you can, get, you can gauge the kind of the amount of 
support structure you've got in there. Mm. We uh, reached out to the guys uh, that do the models mm -hmm. and asked them to uh, do some additional cuts to the wyvern to allow the wyvern to fit on a resin printer bed. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just see the difference in result. Look at that beautiful print from the resin bed. That is going to be so, so much easier uh, to work with. And the, even the nice uh, support structures that the, the resin printer will give you, like they basically just peel away when yeah. you see this. I'll put that down. Now, this is something I've peels. also been experimenting with as well, is lowering the amount of scaffolding I've been putting onto stuff. Nice. So that's a much, much easier system uh, to work with. Mm -hmm. Right. We have one to give away, okay? So post your comments on support structures and FDM printers below. We're now going to give you away this. This is a female paladin on horseback with this incredible pennant banner. Yeah, I have some things to talk about for that as well. So let's talk over some tips on how we printed this. We printed this on an Anycubic Photon yep. um, resin printer again. And uh, Justin, do you want to bring up the bed and we can have a look at it? So yeah. Now, I don't use the, the Anycubic slicer anymore because mm -hmm. Warren put me onto a better one, which is Cheeto Box, which you may have seen on the show before. So Cheeto Box. Yeah. So what you're seeing here is the layout. Now, the first thing I'm going to say, that banner is actually quite challenging to print if you don't take a couple of precautions. Okay. All right. So as you can see, if you look at this, it goes up and then comes back. So you have is that the entire... All the components That's of the, the miniature. That's the entire miniature in one bed. So the miniature will print in one bed? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the first thing I did with this when I was trying to improve it was, you see the raft? Yes. I've changed it to a skate. Yes. Now, normally, From what do we normally print it as? Uh, just nothing. Just so nothing. It's, it's just whenever the, the scaffolding comes down, it just produces a little square, which attaches it to the build plate. Okay, so you've applied a skate to it yes. to give us more bed adhesion, yeah. which comes out something like that. Well... Two reasons. Number one, if you look at the skate, you can actually see, see the way it has that little bit of a lift at the side? Yes. That gives it a little bit more rigidity than just a flat piece. Right, okay. Which means that as it's pulling off, uh -huh. it's not as likely to flex. Right, okay. So that holds it a little bit stronger. It also gives me a bit more footprint, because what I did was, between these two points, yep. I've added a couple of components here to join these up. Once again to try and keep it uh, attached to the bed as much as possible. Exactly, as as so possible. One, one of the failures I was having was one end of the V would start to pull away. Yes. And that would cause the entire thing to fail. Mm -hmm. So by having them connected, it can't do that as much. It keeps it more solid. You're most likely to get failed prints whenever your initial layers don't adhere properly mm -hmm. and, and it starts to actually tear yeah. from the bed. Yeah. It's something I quite like about the Photon is you can pause mid-print. Mm -hmm. It'll lift up. You can actually have a look. Is it there? Is it holding? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's go again. Yeah. So being able to have that pause and just let it continue is very, very useful. Yeah. Now, other things that I've changed. Before the last one we did, I think I was up at like 75% on the scaffolding. Right? Yes, yes. I lowered that this time to about 50%. Mm -hmm. So instead of being like super dense, it looks like this. Yes. And then, as always, you look in beneath and see if there's anywhere that's missed. This looks pretty good to me. What we're looking for is these red zones that maybe don't mm. have a support structure. The other thing you're looking for as well is whenever two of these points, these uprights, are too close together. Yes. Because what you can have happen is they can bind, and when they hit the miniature, they're harder to take off, and they'll maybe rip a little bit out of the miniature because you're trying to break off too much of a piece. Yeah. Uh, other than that, uh, I kept everything pretty much the same. I did increase the exposure time by about 10% on each layer type. So mm -hmm. the initial layer and the other layer, because I figure it's curing. Over curing is never going to really harm it. It just means it's a, a little bit more cured, a little bit more hard. Yeah. Well, just be careful with the over cures because... Um Overcure can also cause it to stick more to your FEP felt, your FEP layer. This is a fair point. Thing. So just, it's one of those uh, suck it and see. Yeah, fi find your sweet spot, experiment. Mm -hmm. Because I've, I've actually been chatting to some of the ones on site. They've actually went and bought resin printers now, which makes me happy. Good. Right. We printed it. Yes. And then as a treat for you guys, what we did was we got John to then sit down and record how he would clean it up and get it to this stage. 
Hello guys, uh, in this <laughs> I've been given the task of prepping this uh, 3D printed knight with unbelievable banner. Um, yeah, so what we're going to be doing is just quickly going through how to take a 3D print, uh, particularly this one which is from one of our, uh, is from our resin bath printer, uh, tidying it up and having it ready to show under camera. So as you can see this is how it comes straight out of the printer with all the... Um, <laughs> It <laughs> looks like a roller coaster, I'm not going to lie. Uh, all our supports and stuff still in place. So, the first step is to free all the parts from their supports and from their rafts and such. So, just have a pair of shear clippers for that. And I think we'll start down here on this quarter horse. And all I'm trying to do initially is just get the, the supports cut from the raft. And what's nice about this resin bath uh, printing is that the supports are, are generally kind of soft. Uh, so they do come off the raft pretty easily. That then leaves it free uh, for us to do a bit more tidying. So I'm going to go ahead and just remove the rest uh, of the parts from the raft. So at this stage, everything's off the raft. I now have to clip a little bit closer to the parts now to get the rest of the supports away. And this is going to take a little while, so I'm, I'm just going to... Just going to time lapse this, or you know, I think we'll just do a swipe, maybe who knows. So let's uh, let's just try, and we want to be as close as we can. We don't need to clip right up to the part, however, because that will become a segment of tidying up after the fact. <laughs> With the parts all removed from the scaffolding, it's now time to clean it up a little bit. So I have a selection of files here that I'm going to use. And the banner in particular, you should be able to see all the little dimples and stuff on it there. Uh, just the small protrusions from the leftovers of the scaffolding. We're going to remove that now with a little bit of a filing. So we want to be as careful as possible as to not damage the resin because it is still quite flexible. Not as flexible as the scaffolding was. So we'll just get in there and try and smooth this off. With all the parts now removed from the scaffolding and all sanded down, we have a good smooth finish on the back of this banner in particular. It's probably the one that had the most uh, visible scaffolding parts. So once that's all done, I just like to get a little bit of warm water and a bit of soap, put it in a little tub and just rinse the parts down. Even use a, a soft brush just to help remove the dust very quick and then just set that out to dry. I have some paper over here we can do that on. Just to remove the dust so that when we come to priming we don't have any mess that gets caught up in the, the priming stage. Now the parts are all dry we can start to assemble our miniature. I've also added in an oval base here to put the miniature onto because I don't really trust it sitting just on the hoofs of the horse. So the first thing we need to do is assemble the first the front half of the horse because half a horse is no good. So we're just going to be using super glue for this. And that should sit in like so. It's like, oh, I haven't missed anything on that one, so that's good. Press those parts together like so. Make sure that's sitting as flush as we can get it. So, not bad. Um, hold that for a few moments. And that should pretty much be it. Blue. In there. Side. And 
we'll place her back onto the saddle. And there we have it. So we'll let that set for a while, and then we'll take it to the airbrush and we'll uh, get some primer and some zenith down on it. So now we've moved over to the airbrush station. I have our miniature here and the airbrush is ready to go. So we're going to be using Steinal Res Black first and then we're going to be zenithing with a white just to catch all those details that will make it look quite nice under camera. So let's just go on ahead and apply our black primer. Now the black primer is dry, we can now zenith the model. So we're going to be using Steinal Res's white primer now and applying it, if you haven't zenith before anyway, applying it in a more top-down fashion. So let's have a look. And this is the kind of effect you get with the Zenithal highlight. You get to see all the detail but remain uh, darker in your shadowy areas. It shows off detail very nice under camera. And there we have it. One Zenith Knight with huge lance. <laughs> so the last thing will just be to take a little bit of matte black paint back onto the base to sort of stop the base detracting from the look of the rest of the miniature. Anyway, that's that. I will pass it back to whoever is talking. Did you win one of our prizes? Find out on our prize claim centre over at ontabletop.com. Here we list all our previous prizes and those who have won. If you see your username, fill out the form to claim your prize. All prizes must be claimed within 30 days. Congratulations if you're a winner! Okay guys, that's your lot. Hope you enjoyed that little bit from John. We thought that'd be something a, a little bit interesting so as you can see how you can prep and work uh, with your 3D prints. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, you can download that model at for, for, for free. Um, the link is in the show notes. It's over at store.ontabletop.com. So mm -hmm. grab it while it's hot. In order to download it, you will need to create a free account. Yes, create a free account. Um, and then you can log in and then you can download it. On the store page. On the store page. And it means that if there's updates or whatever, we can notify you mm -hmm. that there has been updates to it. Right. Um, that's it. Uh, we're done for today, go and check out what we've got going on uh, over on, on tabletop.com. Remember to come and join us for XLBS as a Cult of Games member. We will love you hard and long time for that. Um, big thank you to you guys. Most importantly, massive thank you to you guys. Have a great week of gaming. We'll see you soon. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.